This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to a very blustery afternoon out here in the Sabi Sand Game Reserve in South Africa. That is a beautiful kudu bull and he is just nibbling away on a bit of an afternoon snack which is quite cool but we'll show you all the other wonderful animals that we actually have around here it's actually quite spectacular this afternoon and then I suppose I should say who I am at some point. My name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Craig. And remember this is a live and interactive safari. So hashtag safari live. Or you can also talk to us via the YouTube chat and uh, Facebook. Okay, so what I was going to tell you is that there's just not only this kudu here. We've got all the animals of the Sabi Sand. We've got the Impala. We have got the Zebra. They're here. Why are they here? Why are so many different animals all hanging around in one sort of spot? We haven't been seeing this over the last few days. I wonder if the wild dogs haven't come charging through at some point today, maybe frightened some of these animals that have um, pushed them all together like this. We did see lots of zebra tracks on bushwalk this morning. I didn't see too many of Kudu and well, the Impala tracks are always around, so so that's just one of those things. What I would like to try and do is actually like to try and get another view of that Kudu bull. Shall we reposition slightly? Because he's quite beautiful and um, he doesn't seem to be he doesn't seem to be too nervous. Well, we'll see, we'll test this theory out in a second. Let's see. So we might just have to do the stealth mode where we roll down. Some animals prefer it when we're a little bit on the quiet side when approaching. <clears throat> They're not at all very comfortable with us. He's watching us. I'm just trying to see. If, are we going to make it over that bump? Maybe very slowly. We're still going. We've got a little bit of momentum. No. We, we're still edging. You won't believe it. We're actually still creeping forward at an absolute snail's pace. Come on. Oh, I might have to get out and push with one foot. I think that would be quite nice. That's a pity. He's just sort of out of frame. You can see his body beautifully, though. You can see that he's a lovely bull, and maybe with a bit of patience and a couple more steps as those nice green young leaves lure him well, closer towards us. It's kind of working in our favor today. <clears throat> we'll be able to see his face. There must be, in my opinion, I think a kudu is the most, and a kudu bull that is the most impressive antelope out there. Let's see. Let's see if he's going to finish his mouthful. Come on. Take two steps. It looks like he wants to. Just showing us his nose now. Don't be cheeky. There we go. That's what we've been waiting for. Thank you, big boy. So you see how I say? He doesn't seem to be the shyest of them all. Right. Well, we'll hang around here and see what else these animals get up to. But I'm not the only one on drive. David is also out. A very good afternoon everybody and yes David is out here and I am out with the other David my name is always David and manning the camera is David yes the coalition of David is back and hopefully after the avocas have gone now the coalition of David's will be in here today there's a very big uh, uh, a tweet uh, poll going on between the avocas and the Birmingham boys and many people thought the Birmingham boys might not come back and if they don't then I think the David coalition might be taking over and our only competitors will be the avoca males well we're starting with a lone bull Ellie there Jason, you say, is a quite big boy, and look at him, Jason, by any standard, that is a very big boy, Jason, I agree with you, and you see he is alone, he was first scratching his head with that tree there, and yes, maybe in his late 20s or early 30s, sometimes it's always very difficult to age Ellis, and I'm sure for those who have never joined us, this is the African elephant. And most important, during our drives, we'll always request you to ask us as many questions as you can. Give us your comments, you know, share with us your thoughts on hashtag Safari Life. And you can always follow us on the YouTube chat stream. Look at him, he just went quiet. He has opened, maybe listening to me. He doesn't look to be very bothered, but a big boy. 
restaurant, enjoying the cool temperatures now, and a bit of wind blowing. It's not as hot because if it was pretty warm, you'd see him flapping his ears a lot. But I think this breeze is a very good help to him. Ellie's when it gets warm, they'll keep flapping their ears to lower the body temperatures. Sorry about my papers there. And that's where the cooling of, you know, the temperatures, the cooling is maintained there. <laughs> Kenneth, what do you call a group of Davids? Kenneth, give me some homework to do because I have to agree this with the man or the other younger David I'm filming with. And if I give a name that he may not like, then I'll be in a lot of trouble tonight. Let's keep for now a coalition of Davids. A coalition of Davids will be facing their vocals. But later tomorrow, we shall have agreed. We'll sit down after dinner and agree what shall we be. Shall it be a coalition of David, a pride of David, or friends of David? But yes, Kenneth, we'll let you know tomorrow what we agree. But for now, David is just laughing. Brenda, how are you? And you're asking, is there a difference between the African and the Asian elephant as we move on? Yes, there are a number of differences between the two. And I have always thought our African elephant, Brenda, is much bigger than the Asian elephant. That's number one and most important to me. And two, if you look at both sexes, the males and the females, the African elephant, both of them, they got the tusks, right? The Asian elephant, the Asian female elephants or Ellis, do not have the tusks. Those are two major differences. And then I've also noticed our elephants, I don't want to say they're very wild, I would say they are, because I do not know in any one place in Africa we have been able to train or use elephants as they use them in India, for example, for doing suckers and doing other games or working in the farms. So the African elephants have remained as natural and as wild as they are. Got some impala boy there. Hello there. So those are Brenda. I would tell you could be sorry about that, David. The three main differences between African elephant and the Asian elephant. It's an impala. It's a boy. And you can see how he's moving his ears. Is simply because it's a bit windy. And wind always gives these animals a lot of imbalance in terms of their hearing. So they'll always be a bit careful. So he may not be eating a lot now. He'll be doing more listening to make sure no predator goes to him. There's a gentleman who would like to say a very good afternoon or hello to all of you now. Well, good afternoon and hello and welcome aboard on the afternoon bushwalk. We're coming to you live from the Juma Traverse in the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa. And we are on foot and what a great afternoon it's going to be. I'm pretty sure we're going to find all sorts of things. Now, my name is Ralph Kirsten and on the camera this afternoon I've got Fergus with me. How's it Fergus? Fergus is also going to be helping me look for all the tracks and signs of different animals and we'll be having our noses to the ground trying to catch up with all sorts. And this morning there was also uh, lots of little signs of animals. We did find those wild dogs. And now this afternoon I have heard that uh, Tingana and Gijima have had a little altercation near to Biffles Hook Dam. But around about an hour and a half ago I had some alarm calls uh, from monkeys right near to our camp. So we're going to go around towards Galago Pan and uh, Voyatello Pan as well and see if we can pick up on the tracks. But please don't forget to join us on the hashtag safari live on twitter and on the youtube live chat send us your questions and your comments and get involved on this interactive bushwalk because um, we would like to know what you think about what we're getting up to what you would like to talk about what you what you would like to debate etc etc now it's um 
It's quite a cool afternoon. There's quite a bit of wind around. And as I said this morning, um, the clouds have now built up. And uh, it almost looks like it might rain. I'm not sure, but uh, it does have that feeling because we had a lot of wispy clouds earlier. But they've now built up into a little bit more of cumulus clouds. And so we might be in for a little bit of a dribble. Now, Zephyr, you saying I always wear shorts? I do normally wear shorts, and the only reason I've got these long pants on is because of the weather that is going on here. And a little bit later, we're going to be doing a school um, uh, drive as well. So I'll be heading back and getting into the tent uh, just after sunset when it gets dark. Obviously, we don't stay out when it's uh, dark because of the wild dogs and the lions and the leopards that are walking around here. And hopefully we can catch up with them and uh, get a little bit closer to the nitty gritties. But uh, for now, I'm just hoping that we can catch up. I'm thinking it might be Tingana. Oh, there goes a little scrub here just running out in front of us. I don't know if Ferg managed to see it. They're normally very fleeting. And they normally hide just behind little bushes like this during the day on a little scrape. That's all they do. They don't uh, go down in a hole like a rabbit would. Scrub hares, they just stay up on top of the ground. And they normally also feed just on the little bases of grass um, around like this as well. So they'll be feeding on little shoots, little green stuff like that. And often next to the paths, you can just see where they've been chewing. It's sort of like these areas here where they just they feed on that, on that type of stuff. And there is a lot of scrub hares around. And that does make good food for a lot of, especially the small predators. But even the, um, the leopards and so on, they can also... They can also get stuck into these scrub hairs, which, uh, shame, there's lots of them, but they do get eaten a lot. Now, we're going to head towards Gallego Pan, see if we can get some fresh signs. I'm pretty sure we will do. And while we're doing that, let's head you back to Taylor, who's in the vehicle. Yes, we are. Now, we just moved away from... Uh all those wonderful animals that we had, the zebra, the kudu impala, and the reason why we did that is because we heard something alarming. It sounded like maybe a bushbuck or a nyala barking and almost like running away. And they're pretty reliable, those animals, in terms of alarm calls, so I thought we'd, we'd better check it out. I decided to also just pop past Treehouse Dam. I didn't see anything there. I'm just checking the road now for tracks to see if there's been any movement of those wild dogs because from my understanding they were slowly coming east so it could be them that are up and on the move again and then i heard this morning that tingana and uh, gajima had a boxing match actually had a physical fight at hard at hard pool in buffalo circuit so i found that a hard word to say anyways and uh, and that's where they sort of left tingana was around harder cool camp in um, in buffalo Sook. so and apparently he was he was dominating too, which is pretty cool to see. Apparently Gajima ran for his life and was very, very scared and didn't obviously want to continue the uh, altercation and decided to run off. Mm, no, David, I haven't, I haven't got any updates on conditions. I will ask her. I've got a friend that's staying at um, Voyatella, so I might ask them, see if, or a few of them, if they saw it. I think they may have, though. Uh, and I think if there were any serious injuries, they, they pretty much would have been spoken about by now. So I think it was probably just a couple of uh, paws, swats, and things like that. And then Yojima went, no, I'm not hanging around here. So those bar the barking was coming from down this way, but I haven't seen any wild dog tracks yet. Mm. Now, do we... Let's go check. Let's go down Gowrie Main for a little bit. Wee bumpy. And then we'll go back up to their sort of last spot. Sort of was very close. Yeah. It was very, very close. Um, in sort of where those dogs were last left. And remember, even two kilometers or a mile is it's a jogging distance. Very, very easy for a wild dog to get on the go and cover that kind of distance. So. Sometimes you just need to check out a bit further. I could be wrong. They could be sort of in exactly the same area. Maybe something just gave a Nyala or a bushbuck a fright. It was quite far away. It actually sounded like it may have been on Little Gowry. So we'll just check at Baboon Pan. Let's just check some of the watering holes as well. 
Ah, my goodness. That's something that we'll definitely be looking for today is elephants, but David's got one. Yes, I found the same boy I was watching before, and I made a U-turn and bought, I had lost him to the bushes, and then he popped up. But now he's stuck on that particular bush, and I do not know what he's enjoying feeding there. Initially, he was scratching his trunk and head on a dead tree, but definitely now he's foraging on something, and I've been hoping he'll come out of that corner he is and maybe move a bit forward. The elephants have been a bit elusive the last few days. We have only been seeing one, maximum two, two boys, you know, two big bulls. And the breeding herd must, must have shifted to certain areas where they expect to get enough, especially if they got the young ones, if they got the calves and they are lactating, there is a particular type of food they may choose to go for. But bulls like this, they'll be going either for little branches and then they'll get the back or debuck those branches or whole tree and then they knock it down and then they get the twigs. Just when you're asking what the elephants will eat now, that's the dry season, the grass to me doesn't look to be of very good uh, nutritional value to these elephants. And what they'll keep doing now is to get the trees, especially the bush willows or any other type of tree, and either knock them down. And once they do that, they'll reach the twigs or the branches and they'll see them like chewing a little branch. And they don't get the leaves, so the back of the branch is what they'll keep chewing and getting it out. And sometimes as our elephant moves forward there, I don't know, he's pushing bushes there. Look at him there, Jason. And at times they'll knock down the small trees and you see them feeding on the roots. You can hear how he's pushing the branches there. And I think he's pushing that dead one to reach a particular plant. Maybe he wants below there. And this Ellie is being so powerful, being so strong, to them, the dead tree there is nothing to it. It will just push it aside until it access exactly what it wants to. So they'll also be eating some roots and they've also been known to dig some tubers when it is dry like now and the grass has totally dried up. Occasionally they might go to some small water holes and anything green there they will also feed on. But at the moment they'll be getting the backs of certain trees. You see them getting twigs or branches and just chewing the back which has a lot of nutritional value for them and maybe not the leaves also because much of the trees will be shading off the leaves and any leaves maybe now left on the trees are not of much nutritional value. Tony, how are you today? And that's a good question for 14-year-old kid. Uh, elephant's behavior does not change depending on the season. Uh, they tend relatively the same. Elephant's behavior will only change maybe if they have the young ones and they think you've got people coming so close to them and they want to invade their space, or you get the bulls or the big bulls when they want to mate with the females coming so close to them. But whether it is summer or winter, ideally, the behavior of elephant remain the same. The only thing is, for example, during summer or when it's raining a lot, maybe you may not see them going to the watering holes to drink lots of water because the grass will be very rich in moisture or the leaves or the other plants they'll be eating will have a very high moisture content in them. So you may not see them frequently at the rivers or at the lakes or at the wells or at some marsh areas drinking as much water. Always beautiful to see an elephant, especially this time around when it's a bit dry. And I'm enjoying my bull here, and I'm not the only one who might be having an elephant. Now, we don't have a whole group of elephants. We have got one elephant bull. And it's the coolest thing. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this before, but I've told you tales of how in the Eastern Cape there was a big bull with really large tusks that used to stick his tusks into the mud walls on the banks of the river and also in the quarries and things like that. And he'd, well, sleep by, well, alleviating some of the heavy weight that's coming from his head. 
with his long tusks. How cool is that? And that's exactly what this elephant is doing at the moment. He's fast asleep. Every now and then you can hear the tree actually creaking. And that just goes to show how much weight he's actually putting onto that big jackalberry tree. That's so cool to see. And I can smell he's also in must. There's a very um, pungent goat-like smell, wet dog. It's a bizarre smell when they come into must. And I don't think that that's from the water, although he has had a bit of a splash in some mud before. But we've been fairly lucky with watching elephants sleep, and I like the fact that we're seeing the different ways that they sleep. The ones with the very long tusks, of course, can do this. You really need to have a long set of tusks, otherwise you are unable well, to reach up nice and high and wedge them in there. Yeah, hear that? It sounds almost like a bearded woodpecker doing its territorial call. But it isn't. It's this elephant. He's fast asleep. I think he's, he looks like he's got his eyes shut so tight. I didn't think that many of you would have seen something like this. Like I said, it's not, it's not particularly common. I've only seen it a handful of times in, in my lifetime. And one in case, because one elephant, put, he, well, he liked it, and he's got a very, very big set of ivory on him. This is awesome. I don't know if it's Daryl. I can't tell. Because it's obviously a very obstructed view. I wonder if it is, though. Tusks are almost right, a bit curved. His tend to be a little bit more straighter. But of course, he has got his head tilted quite high, quite high up. His eyes are ew, they're fast asleep. <laughs> oh, he's having the time of his life. Just having a quick nap there. This is, like I said, this is really special. I mean, only every so often do you get to see elephants actually laying down. And we saw so many the other morning. It was yesterday morning we saw so many of them. It was really special. So now to see a big bull utilizing his tusks like this is very special. And you've had enough now. No? He's found himself the perfect spot. I wonder if he's used this spot before. Or if he just stumbled across it. Maybe he was stretching up having a, a good scratch after a bit of a, a mud bath. And then decided, oh, hang on, this is actually quite nice. I might just uh, hold the spot for quite a bit. Now, you are going to hear an interesting sound. There is a tractor on its way, so don't be alarmed. It's slowly coming towards us, but it'll probably just pass us. But it'll be quite noisy. Kenneth, I don't know if, if elephants can go into REM sleep. I, I'm, yeah, I don't know. I'm actually not sure at all. It'd be interesting. I wonder if they've done a study on elephants and, you know, in sort of captivity where it's easier to monitor them. I wonder if they've done anything. But I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. They don't sleep for very long periods of time. But, I mean, the elephants do go into a deep sleep. Sometimes you hear them snoring. And that's always amazing. I mean, I feel like that's an indication that you're having a good f sleep. <laughs> that's really special to see. So this is kind of where the alarm calls were coming from. But uh, I don't see any potential threats around. Not at the moment. We're still listening out, though. Hmm. Magic dragon wizard. I don't know. Elephants do silly things all the time. They're really funny, especially the younger they are, the more ridiculous they seem to behave. So from them ending up doing just about somersaults in the mud to... Uh, oh, there's a lot going on now. We've got now this game drive vehicle and a tractor coming towards us, but luckily this elephant is far away. I think he'll probably just carry on sleeping. Um, so from slipping and sliding, I watched a really hilarious video the other day. I think it was an Asian elephant, and it basically goes down onto its haunches just about and slides down a very, very steep, muddy hill. And uh, it was so funny to see, and that was the way that it went down this hill, and I thought that was hilarious. If anybody knows what I'm talking about, maybe you can share it and show the rest of the world, because it was quite, it was quite funny to watch, although I didn't get to see that with my own eyes. Um, when they sort of jump on top of one another, swimming, I mean, sometimes when you see elephant feet all of a sudden showing when they're in the water, and they're like submarines with their snorkel, which is, of course, their trunk. That's always really funny to see. 
when they cross the Zambezi and it's too deep and you only see trunks coming out of the water, like four or five of them. That's um, that's quite awesome. You can't help but giggle. I don't know, but elephants are just constantly on the co- uh, uh, go. When they throw mud at you or, you know, dust bath you, I think they have a good chuckle too. That's quite funny and quite silly of them. And this is lovely, but I don't think we're going to disturb this boy too much more. We'll let him carry on with his sleep. I'm ho- hoping it's Daryl, but again, I don't actually know who it is. Okay. No, no sign of wild dogs over here, so we're going to go back the way we came, and I'm going to send you to Bushwalk to see if they have found any predator tracks. Well, everyone, yeah, what we're up to is looking up on these magnificent jackalberry trees, and because these are such amazing trees, I find, you always find them along these uh, riverine sort of drainage lines. And um, this is one of the evergreen trees, uh, one of the only ones that we get around this time of year that still have leaves. But they will continue through the winter months, so uh, always supplying a good level of shade. You know, even in winter here, we do get still quite warm. Uh, in the middle of the day. Uh, obviously, we do get quite cool, if you, as you would have noticed, uh, in the morning and evening hours. But uh, during the day, this kind of tree would still make for an excellent spot for a leopard to go and climb up and use it as a vantage point. I'd love to climb up this tree and have a look from there, but uh, it's not exactly easy to get up to that point over there um, and get on up to the V and be able to climb up. But this, as I say, very good uh, place for a leopard to go up because lions would struggle to get up here. And so that's where they, their climbing skills really come into real full effect um, when they're able to especially make a kill, kill an animal like an impala and take it up this tree like this. I mean, the, the climbing skills of them is absolutely incredible. And very often when you do come close to them like this, you can look around and you often see these little uh, spots of bark that are missing. And that's normally a good indication of an animal that's been climbing up here. And as it goes up, you see the little spots there like that, um, the little clear spots, a lighter color on it that uh, gives you the impression of a, of a leopard that's moved up. Now, you can often also find some real scratch marks and territorial markings I can't see any on this particular tree for now. And I like climbing right up into them, if I can, without killing myself. Um, because uh, often when you go up there as well, you can see a lot of scratch marks, etc. Right up there. Now, Linda, you were thinking it's a good leopard tree. I think so as well. And I mean, I, I'm not uh, such a big one into hugging trees, but just to give you an idea of how thick this trunk is, I mean, I'm not even a quarter uh, of, the, of the base of this trunk. And one of the trees that I've always been fascinated with is that of the baobabs. And I've seen one in Zimbabwe that takes 25 people holding arms like this to, hold, to go around the base of that, of that trunk. Now, obviously, jackalberries don't get that big, but um, this is real solid wood as opposed to a, a baobab, with, which is a lot more fibrous and almost held up uh, mostly with water. If you've ever seen a baobab that has died, um, it literally starts to just melt away into the soil. I saw one in Pafuri that had died, and it was still full and held up by all of that water. And literally six months later, I came back, and it was almost uh, part of the soil. It had literally vanished, and all you could see was just this fibrous-type stringy, uh, it's almost not even bark. It's just really fibrous, and I believe that they've even declassified or reclassified the baobab because of this. They believe it's more like a, I think more like a succulent than a woody tree per se. But um, I always enjoy coming near to these trees, especially when we're walking in areas where leopards are frequent and uh, just almost imagining when um, these leopards go up there. It's absolutely fascinating. So... Jamie, I would 
exactly love your redwoods. I love the yellow woods that we have in South Africa. We don't get them here in the Kruger National Park, but where I'm from in the Eastern Cape, in the um, Woody Cape section of the Addo Elephant National Park, we've got very, very big yellow woods there. Some of the last remaining of the real large yellow woods, because I'm sure like the redwoods as well, they would have been used to build things like ships. So a lot of them have been cut down, but um, obviously the yellow woods, the, the largest of our woody trees and I know the redwood is obviously much bigger than that but even those yellow woods that we do have are humongous uh, David I think that this tree I, I reckon it would at least be about a hundred years old I would have to say so so once again I mean I said it before but this this tree could definitely tell some stories uh, especially with the animals that have moved through this area and all the leopards uh, that have come and gone and something else that's interesting I don't know if you can come around on this side a little bit but you do find uh, very indicative of quite a lot of these large trees um, but especially like with the lead woods um, they get a branch that's just up here. You can see this dead branch that's sticking out over here. Because because of this granitic acidic soil, I'm sorry Ferg, that's a bit of a climb, but uh, this dead branch over here, now that's because of this um, acidic granitic soil. There's a lot of uh, some minerals, etc., that it can actually be toxic to the tree. So they have a, a sacrificial branch like that, that they actually pump all those ex excess nutrients into, and then that, that branch will die. But um, it's actually uh, quite a savior to the rest of the tree, and it's uh, very interesting indeed. Now, Bronek, um, the bark on that sacrificial limb won't be growing back because, uh, as I say, the tree is actually going to be using that as an almost um, excessive nutrient pump site. So it pumps all the excess into that one, and then that one dies, um, but sacrifice just that one for the better good of the tree. It's uh, totally amazing uh, how the trees can also survive, even when there are excessive nutrients. Well, we're going to continue on the search and see if we can find some tracks of Tingana, but always stopping for all these little interesting things in between. All right, I think we're off, and we're going to send you to David. Well, I've been looking for any trucks on the northern boundary now, and what I'm enjoying at the moment is such a long and unwinding road all the way on the boundary. And just look at that road there and see... What a beautiful wilderness we are in, eh? If it wasn't this road that has been done by man, with a man-made path for us to be able to do the game drive, just look at the beauty of where we live and where we work. The only maybe big animal we could see from a distance from here is either an elephant or maybe a giraffe. But this shows a lot of beauty there. Just look at that, and we're checking for any trucks on this northern boundary. We haven't seen any, so we're going to be now entering to the right, and you can look clearly, and you've seen nothing big all the way up. So we're going to turn to the right and go around a buffer swap waterhole, where I think we saw the lumber last night. Find out if the of her again today, or the mother is around. It was so interesting to see her late last night on her and that's why I did not stay with her for a long time because at that age, sorry, I might be having some gremlin. Let's go to Taylor now. That was very quick. Right, gremlins are attacking us. Normally the wind brings in the gremlins, I find, and it is a bit, bit windy today. I'm so confused with, with what's going on with the weather. Normally it's so calm and there's really not much wind at this time of the year, but um, I suppose things are changing. Um, we haven't found the wild dogs yet. I did think that I had. I was so excited. I called to Craig. I said, ah, there they are. So got them. Wasn't. It was a log and some elephant dung tried at least but we, we failed so we're still looking for the wild dogs but uh i don't know if you know if they're still on the property i did um i did have a look for their tracks crossing out on gary main and i didn't see anything so i thought we'd just come around here and just have a little looky and see 
if there are baths. I'm just trying to think. From here, we're on Zoe's Road. Where are we going to go to next? We're going east. Maybe we need to check Rebecca's. Or maybe Mendoza Road. What do you think, Craig? I think we must check this road. It divides this block in half. That's what I think we're going to do. Because maybe they didn't even end up coming too far east. Perhaps they're still really quite close to where they were left off road. It'll be quite tricky to try and find them again. If they are just laying off road, then we'll have to wait until they get up and start moving and then we can hear the alarm calls. That will, of course, help us. Well, that's the plan. Maybe some more elephants. That would be very nice. I'm not, um, not even asking for a leopard. I don't care. A leopard will just show itself and it wants to show itself. Perhaps Hukumori is going to magic himself in front of my car like he sometimes does. Maybe we'll have to go to Treehouse Dam at 5 p.m. Because that's like the crepuscular period, that time when uh, Hukumori seems to just arrive. We'll see if he comes back. Maybe he does that for us tonight. Well, we're going in the right direction to find some elephants. Are we? Oh no, they're not. They're going down there. We want to go this way. Okay. Next time. Yeah, we'll see what we can do about cats. They've been few and far between. Seems like, other than the stick sprites still being around. And I think they found the Yunkahumas. Not much has been happening in terms of leopards. But it sort of, it goes like that. Some days we have a week where we've got so many leopards coming out of our ears, we don't know which one to go to. And then other days, for a week, we just don't see any cats. And we've been fairly lucky over the last little while. We'll try and squeeze in a bit of birding too. As I said, that I'm desperately looking for a bird. Where are the birds? Okay, we're going to go here to the left. Julie, those um, those dogs need to find a suitable den, and um, I believe they like to den on Torchwood is a good spot. There are some massive termite mounds there. So once the dog has found a den, yeah, she she'll utilize it, but the male will stick with her, so she'll go off. And he'll keep visiting the den. If it's just the two of them, just the two of us, can't help but say that. Oh, a lilac crystal gorilla, hang on. There we go, that's quite nice. Thank you very much, Bert. Please stay there for two seconds so we can look at you. And uh, and I reckon for the first little while, those dogs are pretty vulnerable. Mom might stay at home with them, and then I think the male will go out and hunt, and he'll come back and he'll regurgitate food up. He, he will help feed that female, because... Um, they normally always leave somebody at the den, but it's going to be tough with just the two of them now. Especially while they're so vulnerable. But once, after a few days, maybe up to a week or so, I think mom will maybe start venturing out a little bit. But again, they're fairly helpless when they're born. But they don't really change den sites too often. It's a beautiful bird, hey? I don't think you can ever get tired of looking at a roller. Can you? Nah. Balancing in the wind though. Got some good moves. Just having a look around, I just heard something else give off a call. Maybe a little... I don't actually know what that was. But I can't see it moving around. Very quiet. It's eerie, it's so quiet. I can just hear the rustling of the leaves from the wind. I don't think you can hear it. And as I say that, the wind dies down. Here we go, Karen, your favourite bird, just for you. I especially went out looking for this bird today, and as it flew from the grass, I think it actually ate something. It looked like it was doing a nice little bit of swallowing. Maybe the, the spiky legs of a grasshopper weren't as easy to swallow as it thought. Very nice. It's warmed up. Now that we're sitting in the sun, it is actually quite warm, and I feel like I could take my scarf and my jersey off, but then I know as soon as I keep going, that's not going to be the case. Cool, let's go. Let's see what else we can find. Mm -hmm. um, those are not nice tracks. I'd like to see some southern ground hornbills today. I don't think I've seen them for quite some time. 
I haven't even actually heard them first thing in the morning, which is something that I definitely miss. I used to hear them calling a lot in the Mara. So, I think we haven't seen any of those tracks, any wild dog tracks anywhere. They've either crossed out or they're still in this block. So I'm going to check very carefully for any heads that may pop up and then I'll also check the ground for some tracks. Um, Tom, I don't know. I can't say that I've ever seen any preference given to a female that's pregnant in terms of wild dogs feeding on a carcass. I think they wild dogs are amazing. They all share with one another. So I mean, like I said, they'll go back, they'll regurgitate for the pups if they're old enough. And if there's anybody left behind, um, they will I'll regurgitate for them too. So if there's an injured dog or whatever it may be, they help them out. And then sometimes they bring back the heads of the animals. They're quite fond of bringing back the heads of Dacre and Steenbork, I suppose, because they're easy to carry. Not necessarily that there's much flesh on there, but it keeps the puppies entertained. It's a bit macabre, but they do literally bring back chew toys for the youngsters and then they run around and chase one another. That's pretty special to see. So it'll be exciting. I wonder where this dog is going to choose a den. From I mean, from what Ralph said this morning, she's looking heavily pregnant. And the last time I saw her, she had a big belly as well. It could have been from the food, because they had just, no, they were finishing off with some kind of animal. And, uh, but I did see the memory glands look like they were getting quite swollen. So I'm sure she's close. And it's about time. It's about that time now, June, July, that they have puppies too. I'm trying to listen out and see if any of the other packs in the Sabi sand, like the Toulon pack. I actually haven't heard much about the Toulon pack for a while. They were quite a big pack that hang, uh, hung around down south. But I don't know what they've been up to lately. Sure, where's this? I'm going to hear an Oriole now. There's a lot of them around at the morning, mo moment. A lot of tongue twister. And I can hear some other birds. I can hear some magpie shrikes now too. Maybe they'll be easier to find. Oh, there's a hornbill. I know it's not the greatest for you. Sorry. But there is one. Look, there's life. Oh, my goodness. What are you eating? Termites? I wonder if it's gobbling up some harvested termites. We've been seeing lots of them today. They've been hard at work. That's the magpie shrike you can hear calling in the distance. I would imagine... that. Well, I suppose poking the ground and sat such quick succession would mean that there's termites or ants around. I can't see any gathering of sort of bits of grass at the entrance of a tunnel. That's always a telltale sign that there's termites around. Well, harps to termites, and they're normally quite active during the day too. Very busy. Okay, well maybe this is what we're going to have to do today. Perhaps we're going to have to do a bit of birding instead, and I wonder if our dear friend David is thinking of the same thing. Yes, we should all think of the same thing and follow trucks, but the last three, four days we have all been frustrated by trucks. We keep following trucks. They do not lead us anywhere. We keep looking for prey like terrapins, which leopards will always feed on. Like you see there, fully grown terrapin with a young one in the front. And earlier I was talking about Kralamba, which I think she's the princess of the Queen of Juma that we saw here last night. And I was saying we did not stay with her for long because she looked a bit sensitive and it was a bit late. And the best thing to do once you get the young cubs, either of lions or cheetahs or leopards on their own, is to give them their space and let them do what they exactly want to do. And I was just thinking maybe she could have wanted to come and get a terrapin for herself and go and exit mom and show mom, look, I got a kill, I made some prey, I got some prey for myself, you know. Hippo, scuba Steve, I think just plashing the water there, trying to keep, trying to make me keep quiet. There he pops up his head a little bit. And I think this guy is always very lonely, living here by himself. Very red eyes, red ears there. Sometimes you'd see them secreting some red liquid, making their ears very red, which helps to protect them from getting dehydrated. 
That's why many times, a long time, people would say hippos would sweat blood, but it's just kind of secretion just to, you see, around the eyes, around the ears. Disappears again, and I'm sure she should be up again for some oxygen. So yeah, and I thought Kalamba could have been trying to get a terrapin and to get home. So what, what I think, she must have gone on her own just to play about and they must have, you know, regrouped with the mother, whoever they are. She's just too young to be on her own. And the best thing we do at that age when the cubs are very young, we'll always try to give them the space because they're quite sensitive. And if they're with mothers, definitely they behave differently and they have more courage to face the people or to face the cars. And Scuba Steve says hello to all of you. And you can see he just had you and he popped up his head to say hello to all of you. And how don't know how we're going to get a mate for him because he's always lonely. The time you see two of them and sometimes three. Oh, yeah, that's the second one there. Very good. Look at them just turning around and having the best of their life. The only thing is they may jump and turn around like that, but they'll not be able to swim because of their high density. But you can tell the dam is not very deep. So they can just stand. Don't that, don't touch that all. You're asking whether we get alligators in South Africa. Not really. We do not have them. What we have that could be similar to the alligators are crocodiles. Crocodiles, and I've had way back, I don't know how many years ago some 50 well 100 years ago there's someone who loved wildlife so much and he decided to bring alligators to africa and they had they only survived for three months and they all died i don't know what country he brought them in but it's a part in africa here like 100 years ago and they never survived so i think the feeding habit and the weather conditions would not maybe be very good for the alligators we don't have alligators here but we got crocodiles all right, we're gonna move on. We're just hoping we'd be lucky like yesterday with Kalamba. Maybe not today, maybe later. Who knows when to cool off. And as I said earlier, I think she was just behaving like any teenage, going out on her own playing. And I wasn't worried she wouldn't go back to the mother because as I said, she's just too, too young to be on her own. you're saying are there any distinguishing marks we can use you know for telling hippos that could be rather difficult because normally we'll always see hippos in the water and during the day and should we see them at night and using our infrared I don't think we shall be having the right tools to identify hippos it's very difficult the only thing we do sometimes they fight a lot and we get some having very bad scars or should we get a hippo that maybe was bitten by another one and has a tony here it's very easy to do that but I have not seen any like in the spot patterns this we you know you we use for leopards there's a particular elephant here a female that have like a short trunk such very clear signs that you can tell hippos one hippo from the other I think for hippos it's quite a challenge eh? I think for hippos it's rather difficult maybe as I said if you get one with a tony ear or one that could be missing and you know a canine tooth or you know a canine one because they always have the teeth coming out and we follow them and we know their territory we know where they live like if you go to the buff sock water hole which we just came from or you go to the Chito water hole, where we shall be going much later on, and you identify a particular group of hippos that will live there. So you can always follow one anytime they yawn, you'll always see it's missing a current teeth because they're very prominent. That way could be an easy way to do that. But just looking at them physically, I think it's tough. David, you agree? Yeah, David agrees. I mean, uh, he has grown seeing all these animals here, and he agrees. Is quite a toughie to tell one hippo from the other. Maybe Raf might have an idea how you could tell one hippo from another.
Yes, I'll tell you now. I'm just having a quick look because this is one of the game paths that um, Tingana likes walking on. Um, and this is just below the Mlo Wati, uh, well, the Vuyotela Dam. We're just running alongside uh, the Mlo Wati here and just trying to uh, ascertain. We haven't got any fresh tracks just yet, but um, there's another drainage that just uh, feeds off of this that we're going to go and head up there as well. And that's quite close where I saw those uh, two honey bags as well so I want to go and get in there on foot and see if we can get any signs of them maybe we'll if we get some tracks we could even trail some honey badgers that would be awesome but um, in terms of hippos uh, obviously male and female uh, it's it's if you see them next to each other it's quite easy because of the size and the head shape of a male much bigger it's almost like uh, with elephants um, male and female as well where you do get that much broader size to the male compared to the female who's got a lot more sort of angles on her skull the male also has those very uh, big tusks especially from underneath which makes the lips sort of uh, curl over on the top and then you look around the eyes where the female is very pink around the eye and the male becomes quite black so I often say it's like a eyeliner or what, or what was it with females ladies um, uh, sort of pink uh, makeup uh, that, the, that the female hippos have got so that's something to look at just with the heads of them which is often all that you see uh, with hippos now Herbie's just pointing something out to me on the tree over here what you found there Herbie oh look at this little worm it's always funny when you see these little worms because you see how he's only got the legs on the top part of his body and also only on the bottom. Now it's very windy today, so sorry if there's a bit of movement around, um, but you see how he walks. Uh, that It's almost like a concertina type effect, how he goes and shifts. There we go, moves the back forward, moves the back forward. I wonder if he's feeding here off of this... Uh, Red bush willow. Not quite sure exactly which um, caterpillar that is, but also would make very interesting tracks because you would see very little uh, the, the, the feet uh, and maybe a little bit of a drag mark and then coming forward again. So it would actually make very, very interesting tracks if this little guy would ever go on the ground. But that is fascinating. Look at that, hey? And with the wind that you can see coming through here with the leaves moving like that, it does make, obviously, uh, walking in the bush a little bit more tricky because we don't get to hear as much of the alarm calls and any of the animals moving around as well. But uh, it's interesting that some of these caterpillars, this is the time when they are active, um, in the, closer into the winter times. And there's very specific ones. One day, he also looks like he's got some kind of little silk with him as he moves along. It looks like he's searching for something. I don't know if he's going to be feeding. That is very, very cool. Concertina type, almost like snakes in their track as well. And some of them move between stones and so on. They also use that concertina type effect. But obviously, this is on a vertical level. The snakes will do it on a horizontal level as well. It must be quite interesting to have your body as a very long um, unit like that. Obviously quite uh, exposed. I mean this little caterpillar you can see is pretty very soft body. So I wonder if he's got any kind of protection other than the fact that he's very well camouflaged. Looks very much like a stick. I think that's probably his defense mechanism. Looking like a stick. Well, thanks Herbie. I like it when Herbie's looking for things when I'm chatting with you guys. That's always great. And so I don't see too much along here. Jason, you want to see some hairy spiders? Well, let's have a look in this termite mound here. We often do find spiders. Oh, there's a daddy long legs spider in there. We often find daddy long legs in these holes like that. He's not very hairy himself, but uh, oh, and there's a bug on the side. So that's a daddy long leg spider. Not dangerous at all, but there's something that's quite hairy on the side here. I don't know if you can see that. What in the world is that? Is that a type of hairy stink bug? Can you see that, Ferg? Let me come on this side. Let's have a look if we can get that in the frame there. That's right on the side there. It looks like a very hairy type stink bug, I think. 
I'm not going to be sticking my hand in there because there could be all sorts of other spiders waiting around the little corner there. But it is fascinating. I think it's some kind of stink bug. And we did recently also have a, a very big hatching of, of small black stink bugs when we were driving at night and we had the spotlights up. There were thousands of them that really came and irritated us. And if you swatted them, they really did stink as well. And they were all around the kitchen, around the light, that we couldn't even put the light on to have our uh, dinner presented uh, on the table because they would. So I'm going to try and find some hairy spiders. There's none in that one. Now, KF, as we're looking down into the labyrinth down there, I would say some of the most dangerous bugs. Um, well, firstly, you, we've got uh, uh, the black button spider, which is a neurotoxic spider that can actually cause um, uh, death if uh, not treated. Now, I can't see too much in there. But um, other bugs that are dangerous we get the assassin beetle as well as the blister beetle which um uh, the assassin beetle obviously just um uh, it, it it attacks and kills and eats other bugs but uh, a blister beetle they walk on you and then they they literally urinate on you and it's a very um p uh, potent um, acidic uh, liquid and immediately you start blistering so those ones are terrible I've had a few of those walk over me and you don't really even feel the bug you just start feeling a burning and immediately you start getting blisters so those ones are quite quite dangerous um, I would also say then maybe hairy caterpillars we've been seeing quite a few of those I'll try and spot one or two of them for you while we're walking out and I'm sure Herbie will try and help me find a few as well as we come past that termite mound that I was up on um, so this time of year is not great for little arthropods and things like that um, but I'll do my best because there's quite special ones at the moment um, and, and obviously filling quite an important niche at this time of year making a little food source for some of the birds that don't migrate right I think once again, continuing along the path, we're going to try and catch up with those honey badgers and Tingana. In the meantime, off to Taylor. We haven't got anything for you just yet. I've been thinking about my hook stick from this morning, though. <sighs> I'm lost without it already. I think it's going to have to be my next mission on a bushwalk. I was going to go there now and fetch it, but then I just thought, you know what, it'll probably be quite fun to find it on a bushwalk again. So I don't know when I'll be on. Maybe tomorrow morning? No, not tomorrow morning. Maybe tomorrow afternoon I'll be doing bushwalk again. And then I'll say to Herbie that that's where we need to go to get it. So I'll save it. So then that means we don't actually need to be driving here. I don't know where the wild dogs are. What's, what's going on in that tree? Craig, in that big silver cluster leaf, there's lots of birds in there. They all look like they're hopping around. I think most of them are starlings. Look at how many there are. And they are fairly gregarious birds. Oh, some of them are regurgitating up seeds. Some are just singing a song. Others are grooming. And the others just doing nothing, just sort of sunbathing, I suppose in the silver cluster leaf tree, but quite a few of them. And this used to happen in the Mara too, with the, um, what were those starlings called again? No, not the wattled. Someone help me please, because I've completely forgotten. What starlings were the ones that we used to hear at Sala's camp in the Masai Mara all the time? I have a recording of it. Is that gonna help? Maybe I'll even play it for you. Let's see, Mara Valley birds. Not, not, not quite the superb starlings. Um, it was the Rupels, the Rupel starling. That is the one I'm talking about. Why did I close it? I wanted to play it for you. And it's something that you used to hear all the time. All the time. Let me get to it quickly. Where is it? Rupels. Alarming. James Hendry soul song. <laughs> We'll have to listen to that later and see what on earth that is. Where is it? I just saw it now. It was so nice. Here we go. Everyone ready for this?
That is literally what you used to hear all day long, all night long, was, um, of course, all these beautiful birds. I have another one, Sala's Bush Camp Bush Chorus. Let's listen to this one. All sorts of things going on over there. It was always so busy and so beautiful. It was honestly um, one of the most amazing sort of areas for birding. Not even just to see the birds, but like, we, like you just witnessed there, just to listen to them. You could just listen for them for hours and hours and hours. It was so pretty down in that valley. Paula, it was. It was very noisy, especially if you're not used to it. To me, that kind of sound didn't bother me, but I know it used to drive James and Brent crazy they couldn't stand it they said they couldn't sleep craig did those sounds bother you much when we stayed at sala's or could you sleep through it sala's was all right says craig i thought it was magnificent and <laughs> just for the sounds and remember the one night that when the elephants attacked, they didn't really attack, they just arrived in camp. I had those, also those recordings are there where the elephant is strumming one of the guy ropes going dying, dying. That was, that was still hands down one of the best experiences I've ever had in sort of a tent before, just laying there and then just seeing the silhouette, because it was like full moon, so you could sort of just see the silhouettes of the elephants and then we were surrounded by them. A huge herd was uh, hanging about, they were trumpeting and and because you're literally just a few millimeters away from them, because some of them are right up a tent, uh, on the tent, rubbing up against it. We had male lions rub up against the tent once. That was pretty cool. Oh, man, it was so beautiful down in that section of the Mara. Really, really wild. But luckily for us, we get those sounds too. Oh, very quickly, I think Rolf has got a cool antelope. Exactly. That. Exactly. Look at that stain book there. I mean, if there's anything I've admired of antelopes of this size, it is the stain book. Of all its body parts, my favorite part are the ears and the inner side of the ears. Now, there's something unusual here. Stainboks are always very shy antelopes because you'll see them, they'll pose, they look at you, you point the camera at you, three seconds maximum, five, off. But this one, it is just giving us the best view. And she's feeding and not worried of anything. Look at that. And Stainboks being browsers, Definitely digging for some fobs. Hilary, I agree with you. What a little beauty, Hilary. Why don't we enjoy it together? And what a small little boy there. Hilary, I agree with you 100%. What a beauty. And knowing what Steinbox are um, made of in terms of flight, I think Steinbox is an African word that means stone. They'll always pose, freeze like a stone, and then they fly away. But this particular one, it's saying to all of you nice viewers, I want to give you the best from me and show you not all the Steinbox are scared. Look at the size of the ears. And David Ali was commenting on how unproportional the body is with such a small head and huge body size and also huge ears which they ideally need for their survival. You can see they're all stretched out and what he is eating now is any fobs, any small plants on the ground there. They will not eat grass and that's what you see him approaching there anything that still has some nutritional value in it bit of light look at that and then he's gonna stop chew a bit let's find out if the bushwalk team has some nice update for us well everybody
everyone. That's very interesting because we came down into the drainage line because we heard the great go away birds doing their usual quack, quack, quack. And we thought well, maybe we were in luck for Tingana. But you see how we can get put off sometimes by these little birds because they're actually watching that Vero's eagle owl and all alarming because of him. And I'm pretty sure that this is the same one. Uh, maybe of two that we're seeing here in this drainage line. Um, I'm not sure how, uh, what sort of picture you are seeing, but it looks like he's turned away from us. I'm looking at him with my binoculars now. Uh, he's showing his back to us, but still looking out over his shoulder towards us. Obviously, we wouldn't be able to get too much closer to him. And Fergus is right far on his zoom there, so sorry if there's any little wobbles. Uh, but uh, that's about as close as we're going to get because we took a few steps forward and he did get a little bit nervous of us. So I don't think we can get any closer. There's also squirrels alarming as well. So they can very often do that with these, uh, with these birds. Ravinda, absolutely, I agree with you. He is so well camouflaged. And the only reason we started looking, and Herbie spotted him with his eagle eyes, or I should say owl eyes, because um, of those alarm calls, as I say. And at least we've got him with his eyes open. I found him the other day when he was very sleepy. Oh, and we've got some alarm calls now. I think we might have a leopard in front of us. Yes, everyone, I think we do. Let's go, come. Let's go, come. The impalas are all alarming. Just up here. Let's move along. Let's move along. Let's move along. Let's see. Something has been spotted just up here. Alarm calls from Impala. Just move slowly through. Now they've stopped. So let's just see. There's a leopard around here somewhere. Unless these guys were alarming at us. I don't think so. I don't think so, because they're not quite as scared of... Yeah, they are just off to our side. They've all grouped now together. Not as scared of us as they are of something else that is just around here. I'm pretty sure they didn't know that we were there. The wind was it's coming in our face, so we're just moving. I'm pretty sure there's a leopard here somewhere, but maybe just watch these impala a little bit and see which way they turn for us. We just need to ascertain if they gave us a false alarm or not. What are you guys worried about? There's the oxpeckers coming down on the on the impala. And you know they might have smelt us but the wind was coming in our face. Sometimes it does swirl. There's another impala just through on that side there, a little bit across from us. You guys worried about a leopard? Herbie's saying he thinks that they alarm called for us, so maybe the swirling wind just got to them, and because they couldn't see us, but they could smell us, maybe that resulted them in uh, alarming for us, because uh, otherwise they would have carried on. So I think it might be a false alarm. But thanks anyway, Impala. At least you got our blood racing. Because there's now some more Impala just a little bit further up in the drainage line. Well, further down, actually. A little bit across over there. And their heads are down. And they're feeding and carrying on. So I think that definitely was a false alarm. But anyway, doesn't matter. Uh, false alarms are... Also better than nothing happening, and I'm sure we're just going to continue on. It is super exciting, isn't it, everyone? But uh, we're going to leave this drainage line soon and head up another one that uh, we, it, it's not very easy for us to access on vehicle. And that's heading up, uh, what is that? That's Cheetah, Cheetah Cut Line or Gary Cut Line? Gauri Cut Line, that one, Gauri Cut Line, and that drainage line, very difficult to access by vehicle. So nice to go in there with... Um, 
with us being on foot. So we're going to slowly make our way across there, just trying not to disturb these wonderful impala. Uh, and uh, they are our alarm signals, and they do often show us the animals. So um, let's, let's do that. We'll carry on. But while we're looking for Tingana or any other leopard, and hopefully honey badger, let's send you back to David. Well, some of those alarms could be very misleading, and uh, we have always said there are certain alarms that don't lie. Monkeys are always very reliable, and the kudus, you know, kudu with one or two good bucks are quite good to trust. And we just finished watching the Steinbock, which I thought was very cooperative, and Steinbock's characteristically are always very shy and they'll always take off once you spot them but that particular one I might think I will start following it up because they also notice it doesn't have a tail and two weeks ago I was watching it and there's a guest or there's a viewer rather who picked it up and found out it did not have a tail and I think it should be the same one and if it is we should be knowing or we should be giving it a name and I think that particular day we called it the friend we I think the, the viewers name was Cobert and we call it friend and if it's the same one then it must be the one I saw last time so nice bunch of styling there it's time to now the birds are coming out and forming small parties to feed and we'll hear bubblers as usual making noise this I'm not very far from where we are Styling on the road there, very good. And David, did you see the bubblers on the left there? Oh yeah, that's uh, styling on the road there. And then you're just hearing some bubblers making noise. Sorry, someone is calling me on radio, just one minute. Uh, Roger, go ahead, stand by for David. Uh, yeah, we are Teladam, we are Teladam, uh, what hole? Ah, fine, you let me know, thank you very much. Uh, sorry about that. So, but sometimes the forming parties, I was saying earlier, will get bubblers and sometimes hornbills coming together with starlings and feeding and bubblers have been known to be a bit sneaky. They have used other birds, like the drongos as sentries. If they see any danger, they'll want to use the drongos to keep safety for them. All right, we'll move on and see whether we can get some level. So if you pull back, David, I see some beautiful bubbles somewhere. Let me just back up a little bit and you might see it on top of that tree. Tell me when to stop, David. That's good. I mean, look at that crested bubble there. And the other day I was doing a poll on Twitter, which was the most beautiful bird of the three birds I gave. And Crested Babbitt is back with me today, looking for either some lava or some any termites up on that tree. Just look at how fluffy she looks. And the beautiful whites, reds, yellows, oranges, blacks. She just flew away, even moved from very good, David. Gemma, how are you today? And you'd like to know about seeing more in the morning or in the afternoon? It depends on your morning, but if anything you come out late in the afternoon, I would guess anything after five. Four-ish or three-ish is still a bit warm, but anything after five to seven o'clock, you see bats becoming more active because the temperatures by then are cooler. But if you'd ask me between the mornings and in the afternoon, Gemma, personally, I would say the mornings the more bad activity to me, the birds are more alive, they are more active. The birds that you roost on top of trees and you know hide away from the predators and sleep, they need to come out and re energize themselves. They need to eat so they would come out more, I would say, during the day. In the evenings, very few birds will be coming out, apart say, from the owls or the nightjars. The number of birds that you'll see in the afternoon to me are much fewer. So the mornings, I would say, is a lot better. 
to see the birds than in the afternoons. But well, it's the afternoon now, and we're talking about uh, 4.15 uh, Central Africa time, and we still have some good population of birds we're seeing. We're just watching some starlings earlier. Now we have this crested barbet either looking for some food there, maybe fast holding for its dear life because of the wind that's picking up. And you can see how the wind is just blowing the feathers, but still looking beautiful. I was talking about the colors of these babbits and I think or believe babbit are very beautiful birds as much as I see like the lilac breasted rollers, but the red, the black, the white, the yellow, you know, makes it very colorful. They are very omnivorous birds and they could be looking for some food there. Ravinda, you're asking, will the barbet grow a bigger tail like the wider? I haven't seen barbets growing, you know, longer tails than what they normally have. But we have seen like the pin-tailed wider, for example, Ravinda, during the breeding plumage, the tails get quite long. And the Jacksons, you know, some widow birds during the breeding time, their tails get pretty long. But I would say for the barbet, not sure I have seen any growing much taller, you know, uh, the length of the tail changing than the normal size. What I've noticed sometimes the colors might be a bit bright. Look at that beautiful bird there, Ravinda. So I would say I haven't seen the babbit getting the tail a little longer during the breeding, breeding plumage, unlike the normal time. But for widows, you know, widow birds, we have seen them having long, long tails. Still enjoying the blow of the wind there and trying to maintain its plumage. But until maybe the wind dies down, it might have to wait a bit longer. If it was a drongo, we could see a drongo going in the water sometimes to maintain the plumage of their feathers. But the barbets will tend just to wait and maybe just use their beaks to maintain their feathers. All right, barbet, you're so beautiful, but unfortunately we'll have to leave you. Yes, I agree. Yeah, Dave, you can go back, David, to the head and they say it got a mohawk. Yes, I mean, and no wonder they call it the crested barbet. Thank you, David. And the mohawk looks a lot better as the wind is blowing it. Eh? I agree with all of you viewers. It's beautiful mohawk. Eh? And hopefully it will be getting something to eat there. And sometimes the wind might move any moth or some lava there if she is lucky and he is not moving from that place as much as I would guess she is also shielding herself from the wind and she doesn't want to be blown away. All right. Thank you. Uh, we still love you, Babbitt. But unfortunately, we may have to move on. Let's find out if Taylor got some nice update for us. We're not having any luck whatsoever. So doing one last check, although I don't really want to give up trying to find the wild dogs. What's happened here? Why are the squirrels shouting? At what? Craig is on it. Where we need to find them though. This is heard a squirrel going, Yee -yee 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 -yee. can you see it? Craig says he can see it. There it is. What you seen? It's two of them. Is it two of them? No, it's just one with a very fluffy tail. Now it's stopped calling. Maybe it just wanted to say hi. Hello, squirrel. You don't have any secret information for us? No? Apparently not. Okay. Well, that was a waste of time, that squirrel. Hey, we were going on an adventure, then it stopped us. Okay. Let's look. Let's just drive on the fire break. Maybe these dogs haven't even left. Maybe they're still here. They're just fast asleep. I know they were left in some very, very thick um, vegetation, apparently in that Tamburti thicket, which is not necessarily the nicest area to drive in. So I'm going to see where everybody was going off-road and then try and use a similar pathway to get some idea as to where those dogs are. Let's see. I'm going to just keep checking in here, though. Let's see if we can actually find the wild dogs. 
Mm, I haven't seen any tracks going off just yet, so they must have come around the bend. And then I think after this, I think I'm done looking for wild dogs. I think we'll go find some elephants rather. Change our change our route slightly. As it is getting gonna get dark now, and then hopefully if they come running out, they'll hopefully chase some animals around and they can alarm. It was in here somewhere that they were. Whoop, up. I'm mean, getting to that time where they could get on the go too. I think I'm officially done now. We'll just have to wait for them to wake up. If they're still around. That's just one of them things. Okay, where are we gonna look for elephants, Craig? Should we go see one of thing? Maybe that bull is awake, the one that was fast asleep. Wait, shall we go check on him? We'll venture down that way back towards Baboon Pan and see if the elephant bull that was fast asleep is maybe awake now. That's going to be an idea. Okie dokie. Well, we'll continue with our little bumble that we're having today. I think Bushwalk is kind of doing the same. Now, everyone, we just, we're just in this drainage line, um, which is inaccessible to vehicles, and also where we saw those honey badgers. But I've just stopped at this milkberry, because, um, well, we know milkberries, they generally have that very nice uh, milky latex. Um, but the reason I've actually stopped at this is because all these leaves, uh, I'm trying to work out what this is on them, because it doesn't look like it's... Um, it's egg sacs. I wonder if it's a parasite on this particular leaves itself. It's very interesting. I don't know what all of these are. And if you do, you're welcome to send in and tell me what they are. But I'm just investigating and seeing. You know, it does look like suspiciously like galls uh, that, you know, maybe a wasp would make. But um, I'm not quite sure. It's almost like it goes right through it the particular leaves if you have a look it does come out the other end so i don't know if it's something that is growing on it or if it's been stung by a wasp uh, like a parasite and it's actually growing on these leaves and it's going right through the leaves themselves very interesting but uh, you know, sometimes you find these parasites on different plants and i'm just trying to see if there's any like little escape roots or anything on it you know if it was a wasp and they're making a gall then um, you very often find where the little hole is where they started to exit and like on that one there that maybe is some kind of little escape route there but I'm not I'm not convinced I still think it's some kind of parasite more so than uh, <laughs> Jason, you say it looks like chicken pox. Yeah, absolutely. It, um, you know, you do get all sorts of different parasites. And this, this particular milkberry is it's, uh, covered in it. All the leaves have it. So I wonder if it's been infected by some kind of little disease or parasite or whatever that might be. But uh, that's very interesting indeed. Anyway, I think we need to continue along here. Look at this as well. On the other side of the bank here, this is a lovely Tambuti forest here. Um, very indicative, those, that bark on these trees as well. And they are all starting to lose their leaves. And once again, on the ground where Tambuti's are, you very often find very little uh, other vegetation because of those leaves that are getting dropped. Uh, it does affect the soil, and so you don't really get too many plants growing in the vicinity of these Tambuti forests. And very often you find elephants moving below as well because it makes very good shade. Uh, Paula, um, speaking of bugs that invade the camp, I've got uh, myself and Steve and Dave and and so David are the three guides plus Craig, Batman, the cam op. Uh, we've got ants invading our room because we've got a little crack next to the wall and they're all over the place. Uh, they're not biting ants but they are little red ants um, and uh, they are invading the place. So not terrible, not hectic but um, 
Uh, it's just, yeah, it's a real invasion. Now, in the Maasai Mara, you get the Siafu ants, which if you had to get attacked by them, you could, you could actually die eventually because they move through in big columns, and they come into camp, um, and if you had to lie, lie down there, they will literally uh, probably just be skeleton left of you within uh, probably about six or seven hours, I would say. They are incredible. And, uh, but, well, at least we're not worrying too much about the little ants that we have. Not so bad as those Siafu ants. And uh, Brent and Jamie um, would be able to tell you all about that, Scott as well. I know that they've had a couple of um, uh, invasions in the last last few days because uh, we've just had messages on the on the Mara group WhatsApp and it's just Siafu in camp and everyone's like where 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 is it because they don't want to be um, attacked by those guys it's pretty hectic so as I say this is a beautiful drainage line this it's a it's a absolute beautiful drainage line now Malaria is is a problem for us. This is a high risk malaria uh, area. So uh, we do also have people coming in to, uh, you know, pest control just to spray in the rooms because uh, malaria is obviously still one of the biggest killers around the world. And I know Sebastian, one of the cam operators, uh, he he had. Um, uh, malaria not so long ago, uh, but obviously he's gotten through it. So malaria, yes, absolutely a big problem. We don't take malaria tablets, however, and that's not uh, uh, me recommending what you should be doing. But, you know, to take malaria tablets on a, on a long-term basis would be uh, quite uh, silly, and especially um, I think it affects your kidneys and your liver, and it does have quite serious side effects. So I think for now we're going to head up there. We're going to see what we can find. I hope those honey badges are around. Maybe we get lucky. But uh, anyway, off to David. Honey badges should be a good surprise, eh? Because I remember there's one particular pair that was seen by both me and Raf in 24 hours. And I think Raf just saw them the previous night and I saw them the following morning. We thought that was pretty special, would I say 12 hours instead of 24 hours? And we think it was the same pair, which is quite unusual. But you know, once in a while, you know, such things or such uh, sightings come around. I've been looking at winter and wondering, you know, any plus about winter as much as it gets cold. A lot of, you know, trees are shedding their leaves and the grass is getting dry and not of very good quality. But I've thought of one big plus with the winter for me, and the amount of mosquitoes I've been seeing the last two weeks, or since I got here, the numbers have started going down since the last two weeks. The times I'll fight with about 10 mosquitoes, you know, because I don't like using the mosquito net, 10 at night. And the last two weeks I've been hearing most two, and last night I only saw one. So as much as people will be like, it's winter, it's getting very cold, we might see fire breaks coming out if you get some lightning and gets, you know, fires burning the area. Uh, I'm looking on the brighter side of winter and saying the number of mosquitoes, which I think to me they should be the most endangered species, it is going down. And look, in the final control says he agrees with me, because yes, I mean, when you think of it, the number of you hear at night, the times you could not sleep one hour, two hours max, and you come up, you know, smash a few on the wall, and then go back to bed a few minutes later, they would come. But the numbers have gone down. I think for me, mosquitoes are a big concern, and when especially they spread malaria, it becomes quite a challenge for most of us here in Africa. So if the winter could stay a little bit longer for me, I'd be more than happy. Hopefully I don't lose his signal here. Look, I'm going on a small little drainage. Hold on a bit, it's a bit rough here. Very good. And what should happen is mosquitoes thrive very well. Thank you for letting me know that look. Mosquitoes tend to thrive well when the temperatures to me are high and they have a lot of grass cover, you know, to lay their eggs and to hide and to uh, be able to breed. But when the grass will also die like this, it reduces the habitat and the numbers 
also considerably go down. And from the village I come from, as much as we don't have winter or summer, we have seen when we don't have as many mosquitoes out there, there are not as many cases of malaria. And when I think of the many diseases or many health issues that face us here in Africa, I've always malaria is bigger threat to most of us than even diseases like HIV AIDS. Many people have always thought, you know, HIV AIDS is a challenge, but to me, malaria is the biggest concern. So I would be more than happy having winter staying a little bit longer and having all the mosquitoes gone or maybe reducing their breeding status to almost zero. The one day I'm going to sleep through a whole night without one zzz on my ear, I think I'll have a great night. We want to swing by the Galago waterhole and find out if there could be any news. The temperatures have gone now, down now, and it's good time now for leopards to wake up, move around. All the frustrations have been going through the last few, four days without anything. And I remember Taylor the other day saying, I'm not going to follow your trucks, David. I've been following them. I'm so tired. Taylor, is that true or not? I didn't even have any tracks to follow, David. Otherwise, maybe I would have been a little bit more excited. No, we've moved away. We're in the Mulati now. Woo! I want to do some birding. I'm envious that you had a, by the sounds of it, it was a great bird party. So we're looking for our own one now. We're going to join them. Hey, Craig. We're going to get our boogie on. <laughs> Does anyone even say that anymore? But anyways, so <laughs> hopefully we're going to find some of these birds. Oh, there's, sometimes there's a brown hooded kingfisher that sits around here. I'll keep my eyes open for, him, for it. And then maybe a black collared barbet. It's another great one. Mm, still haven't found the area. Uh, ar what? I don't even know what language I'm speaking. I'm just making up words today. Orange breasted bushrike is what I was going to say. We'll be looking for one of those because I've been talking about them for how long now? Okay, I just, I've just seen some birds. Let's see if they're going to hang around. Shh, shh, shh. I don't think they can hear that over the sound of the car. That wasn't very clear though. Yeah. Can hear you, birds. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've got leopard tracks, but these could be from the other day. I don't know. Mina Moo, Mo, I suppose it's just the way that they're designed that some birds have crests, some have more colorful feathers than others. I suppose it's all got to do with just their genetics. There's leopard tracks there. I don't know when they're from, though. I don't know who, when last someone drove in the Mulwati. Uh, they're going back that way. Maybe we must do Mamba Loop. I think we might have to do Mamba Loop because that hugs all the way down there and I only saw tracks just around the one corner I'm trying to think anyone drove in the Mulwati there this morning okay well that's good and we've just finally seen our first predator track for the day how exciting okay come on birds we're not having much luck today the animals don't want to be seen by Craig and I well, they don't want us to see them. Oh, what was that? That was pretty. Was it a crested barber? It was a bird. Oh, no, it's a kingfisher. No, come back. Can you see it? No. We're going to get it. It's just flown. Ha ha. Mamba loop. There's a road there, kingfisher. <laughs> We're going to get it. Okay, it's going to be on the right-hand side. Nervous. Look like a brown hooded. I'm just focusing to see if I can find it before it sees me. No, I think it's just flown again. Uh, see, I didn't see where it flew to. Oh man. Why do none of you want to be seen today? That's so upsetting. Come back, Birdie. It was a very pretty little kingfisher, too. Yeah. What a time to be alive, as Megan would say. No birds for us, no one even basking in the sun. There's, there it is. On, you, on that little dead tree, I can see it bopping away. Um, what are you? That's a funny looking kingfisher, don't you think? 
He's got a little white streak above his eyebrow. It must be a juvenile. So look how mottled those feathers are. I'm still going to stick with my gut and say a brown hooded. I think it might just be in between molts. Let's just go to kingfishers because the other option it could also be a striped. Let's see if they've got any juvenile photos. So let's go to brown hooded first because that's what I think. Let's see if there's juvenile pictures here. Nope. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let me just see striped. I know while you're looking there. Let's see how there's not quite too much blue. I can't see a prominent. Maybe it's a juvenile striped kingfisher. What is everybody thinking? It's just very, very white. I'm just reading to see. Does they say anything specifically about the juveniles? What's everybody's verdict there? Brown hooded? Like I said, I think it could be a juvenile. Or a striped. So hashtag Safari Live, let us know. They're both very similar in, in the terms of they have very sort of dull blue on the wings. And then the brown hooded has got quite a dark back to it. And then, of course, um, was brown, almost a brown sort of... Uh, brownish crown they're quite heavily streaked mm. Lorena you said your money's on the on the brown hooded I also think so it's got quite a bit of white underneath the throat too you can just sort of see patches oh you see number 40 you're saying striped I'm just having a look I wonder if see, I haven't got any fantastic images oh. Interesting, very interesting. I'm having a look. Let me show you what I've got so far. Let me just give this a little why. I'm just on my bird app. You know, I've got to angle it. Sorry. See, there's a glare, so now we play the game of what? No, it's, it's not going to work in the sun, I don't think, Craig, because of that reflection. So we've got the sun shining straight on the screen, so I don't think it's going to work very well, but there we go. We'll leave it at that. We'll have to wait until we're facing the other way around. That was the juvenile. Hmm. Okay. Well, we're going to have a little chat amongst us. Let's see. What does everybody think? I'm going to go with juvenile brown hooded kingfisher. Anyways, while you contemplate what bird it could be, let's go and see if Ralph knows of any key identifying features of a juvenile kingfisher. Now, I'm thinking, yeah, juvenile kingfisher, hmm, uh, I can't quite think just off the top of my head. They are very, very close to each other, and between the juveniles, I would have to say, sorry, Taylor, can't help you on that one. We'll have to check it out in the books. But I've got something to show you here. Once again, yesterday, we also watched some termites, but they were being attacked by ants. Now... I want you to look very closely in there because there's one little termite doing a little dance. And now he's disappeared on the inside. But these two, there he is again doing a very shaky dance. And so, and there he goes. Now, when when I was studying, um, ec uh, um, etho what was it, animal behavior in and or ethology, uh, as you say, the study of animal behavior uh, at uh, university. We, uh, we spoke about the dance of the honeybees, or the African honeybee, as one of the most intricate communication systems on the planet. Now, that also trickles through to uh, termites and ants as well. All of the creatures that are in a caste system, which um, has very separated functions or roles within different individuals, um, and you've got workers and soldiers and reproductives, etc. Um, but they have a very intricate communication system, and it's through little movements of their body. Is uh, how they communicate with each other, along with different um, uh, chemical signals. But those little dances is them communicating with each other. And you can see how they're busy building a little bit of the um, entrance or exit to their, to their little um, mound or their chamber probably below the surface of the soil. But they're using um, lots of pieces or grains of soil and they're combining that with saliva. And then that's how they, they cement 
at different pieces and looking closer at them here you can um, you can see this communication going on there's also lots of work going on and now I just find it fascinating to watch them especially you wonder what those different movements and shakes of the body mean to each other Justin I have eaten uh, some termites. Um, they generally taste a bit like peanut butter, but I've done it mainly when we've been on anti-poaching uh, sort of camps um, and when we didn't have too much food because they are very, very full of protein. Um, and I'm only going to be eating termites like that when, um, when I, I really need to because I've had a very good breakfast and I'm going to have a very good dinner. So I don't need to uh, shame eat any of these guys, especially when they're fully at work here. I don't want to disturb them because then they'll go into defense mode and you'll probably see that uh, that uh, body language of theirs change immediately and then they'll go, um, probably all the soldiers would come to right at the, the, the entrance here and they start defending as opposed to working like what they're doing and it's incredible even while we've been sitting here I can see that this little um, window or door that they are building on has has literally gotten bigger and it's crazy how they they just continue to work tirelessly on and everybody working on the same for the same goal and you can see bringing up little pieces of stone and then attaching it on the end and other ones going around and doing exactly the same and through those little communication dances it does indicate then to obviously the other individuals exactly what's going on and what they need what what uh, they're going to be doing etc so but almost very um, little is understood about this communication systems that they've got here that's incredible Cindy, um, I'm pretty sure that a lot of these termites uh, have very poor uh, eyesight, if any eyesight at all. Some of them don't even have eyes. So they've got their little antenna that they use to move around with, and then um, they've got a very good, um, they, they can smell the pheromones, etc. So I, would say, I don't even think that these little termites do have eyes. So it's all about those little uh, antennae in the front, and they literally feel their way around. They also feel vibration uh, or movement on the ground. And if I had to blow them, which I'm not going to do, that would also disturb them. And you can see with these ones too, they don't have any pigment in their skin. So that's the reason why they're obviously working now on this particular spot, I would say, because it's in the shade, and so they're actually able to work outside. Very often you wouldn't see them working during the day, only at night, especially if this was exposed to the sun, because you see those very white, um, soft abdomens that they've got, that would be um, exposed to the sun and they would get burnt. So they very often build also sand uh, encloses over uh, if they want to be working on a piece of wood or on some grass or, or something that's outside um, the surface of the soil, then they'll build something over the top of it so that they can work below during the day. Um, and you can also see with the big termite mounds that uh, they work on it at night because uh, that means that um, it leans over to one side. Now, uh, Minamu, um, they are slightly different to ants. Um, they probably are related, but they're a slightly different family. So um, it's a it, uh, little bit different to the ants. And they do, you can see by their body structure, that they are slightly different. There's an ant or two that's a very small ones that are moving in and around there. And there's actually one of the ants. I know it's tiny, but there's one of the little ants here just over there that's attacking one of these termites over there. See how he's dragging him away? And the little ants generally do win over the termites. And there, there's a little kill going on. This ant has obviously come through and attacked. See how, oh, that termite's fighting back. Oh, uh, maybe that ant hasn't won just yet. But it is really tiny, and I know that Ferg's probably struggling there to see exactly what's going on, but I find it intriguing. 
Right, everyone, it is starting to get a little bit later. That sun's starting to dip towards the horizon, so we need to start making our way back towards the camp because I'm going to be going into the tent with Ferg and we'll be hitting that for the school drive. So while we make our way back, let's head you on back to David, who's got a donkey in pyjamas. Yes, we've got a donkey in pyjamas here. I love that look. And I was just wondering if Raf would get very tired way back. We have always related uh, zebras to horses. He would get a ride with his donkeys or with his zebras back home. But not really. We have found out zebras got very soft backs and they couldn't or they have not been used by man or utilized by man like horses on zebra rides or how we have always had horse rides. Maybe not zebras because they got very soft backs. And you see how they twitch, which is always either a reflex if they feel they got a little bite. You see there? Well, well very good job, David. And then if that doesn't help, they'll always go on a tree and they'll just try and scratch themselves. And because of the wind, they're a little bit alert. And when ox pickers will keep bothering them, they'll either use their tails or move their bodies. And they tend to resist the ox pickers on them. A kudu, very good, passing the background there. How nice. I was just talking how they will scratch themselves, and that one is doing exactly that. I'm sure she was listening to me somehow. And more kudus passing in the background there. They must be the same group of animals that Taylor must have seen before. And you look at that one on the bottoms, it doesn't have very clear pattern, the black and white. It's not like the one that's scratching itself on there. More female kudus. Still passing, going the other direction. Monique, fantastic, I agree with you. And David is the person who discovered, he said, this sunset light is just wonderful on these zebras. See how she's, you know, scratching her neck. Monique, I agree with you totally. It's just fantastic light. And you have a bit of sunset now that falling on these zebras. It's just wonderful as she keeps scratching herself. I'm not sure it's just being an itchy skin or they could be yeah, very itchy zebra she is. Or it could be bugs, you know, some kind of ticks. I love the way she's doing it backwards, forwards. And the tree there is coming in very handy. Chelsea, you see such a beautiful mohawk, and it's true. And we have always looked on the mane, for example, on the back or behind the heads or the necks of zebras, and they have always given us the condition, the physical condition, the health condition of zebras. This is very itchy. It's scratching all over. And if the mohawk stands upright like that, we have always known they're in very good physical and health condition. When you see it flapped or falling apart, you can always tell either zebra is sick, but like this one here, as David is showing you, is a great mohawk, eh? It must have gone through a salon to come here. Eh? See how it is standing up. David, do you like it? it. Yeah, David says it's just lovely. And all the brown on the very top. I'm sure some color was put on it. Paula, you are asking whether I have ever seen an albino zebra. Yes, Paula, I have seen one in East Africa, and it is still there. It is in a place or an area called Lake Nevasha, and it was all white, clean white, like a white horse. And people were calling it, you know, the white zebra or the white horse. But it was all white, did not have any black on it. It was all white, and I think I saw it last year, end of last year. It is still there, Paula, and we'll always see them. It's always something genetical, you know, like all other animals in the world, and you know, just like in human beings, I have seen an albino zebra, and it is in an area called Lake Nevasha in East Africa. But apart from the color, it behaved perfectly fine, but it has never been seen. It was a she, it was a female. It has never been seen mating with the other zebras, and maybe people have always wondered what the progeny would be after it would mate with any of the other zebras. Very good. 
Oren, good question. Maybe have a look at those zebras before they leave. I think one of the most difficult is just how we struggle sometimes to tell elephants. Well, elephants could be easier, but for zebras, it's a bit difficult. The only thing we can say, when they're young, the colors have not come out very well. I would say, for example, uh, the, the black and white, as they mature, as they get older, the colors are more conspicuous. But when young, they're more brownish, little darkish, uh, and of dirty white, then you can't tell that's a young one. But once they're fully grown, whew, I think for me, it's quite a challenge to tell their ages. All right, zebras have moved on, and we shall also move on too. Nice to see stripy zebras or stripy donkeys there. Minamu, that's a good question, and you're asking how do zebras communicate with each other? And what they do, as I tell, give you one more time to see it, they'll always grunt, and when they grunt, that's one way of how they communicate. And especially the, the, the communication is more on the males than the females. So they grunt a lot. If there's any danger, for example, Minamu, you'll hear the zebras grunting and they're making all these alarm calls and that way they'll be able to communicate with each other. With some of them, very interesting, they have gone on top of a tamarind mount. Can you go a little closer, Davito, here? Is it closer? I mean, they have taken a very unusual position or location. I haven't seen zebras doing that and they've climbed a tamarind mount. Let's just have a look at them there. And, sorry, let me about that. Look at that. And they've just gone on top of a as they're moving forward, but the light is just fantastic. And all of them together moving in the same direction with the kudus which were in front of them. But this is just great light falling on these zebras. I'm not sure if they could be going for a drink, but they have hung a lot together with these kudus which I haven't seen a lot. Sure, you are loving the baby zebra. Look at that baby zebra there. And as we we're trying to see the edge that she jumps, a very clever baby. The mohawk is not as big as the adult. So that's another difference that you can tell of the ages of the zebras. Apart from the colors, the mane on the back of the neck for the young ones is still pretty short. And as they get older, it gets longer. And of course, the body size will always tell an older zebra from a younger zebra keep always twitching their tails because of the ox pickers. Z, you're asking how long do zebras live in the wild? I'll give an average of about 20 years. Zebras have been known to live, you know, for about 20 years. You've got different types of zebras, but from all the two or three different species of zebras, they've got an average lifespan of 20 years. Of course, you might have one with 17 years, 18 years, some 21, 22, but the average I think we got I could be, I think, uh, is about 20 years. So that's the average lifespan of zebras. Pretty long gestation period too. Ellie, you're asking whether zebras got teeth. Yes, zebras got teeth. And you see zebras are grazers and because they need to eat the grass, as we were watching before, they need to grasp, sometimes they need to grasp the grass using their lips in their mouth, they churn it with their tongue and they leave the teeth just to grind it. If you're lucky one of the days or today, we see one opening the mouth, you're going to see, see when they keep moving there, they keep getting the grass out of you know, from the ground, and yes, Ellie, they got teeth because they will need to chew or they need to grind the grass before they swallow it. That was a very good, good question for your age. Well done. So even the kudus you see there, the antelope that you see in the front there are called kudus. They also got teeth. Most, if, you know, I would say all the animals will have teeth because they will need teeth either to chew the grass or to chew the meat. See that one? I was trying to sniff the female there, but she kept going, and that was a young male there. So the zebras keeps moving, and you see all the birds flying on top of them there are ox pickers, and sometimes they land on their bodies to see whether they have any ticks. 
such a nice head of zebra. So the baby being kept in the middle, and you see the baby is having maybe more or two ox pickers than uh, the, the adults. All right, we'll leave the zebras here and we will go to Taylor. We're not winning the safari today, that's for sure. I've now taken a gamble and we're driving on Buffalo's cut line going towards, well, I suppose the northwest in hope that Tingana or Tandi and Tlalamba have decided to return home. I'm just, I really am just taking a gamble at the moment. So we're just going to bumble along here and hopefully we're going to hear alarm calls. And then I think we might go back towards Vuyatela Dam. I haven't quite decided where we're going to end up. Remember, we have got school drive soon. But I suppose we need to find some animals for the kids. Although I promise I've been trying to find you animals too, but there's just not much. What did you see, Craig? What was that gesture that you just did? You just flicking your hand. Craig went like that and I thought he was either saying hello to someone, put those guns away, put them back in their holsters, Craig or if it was maybe an animal that I was just driving past again because well, we know we, uh, both of us do that, hey Craig? <laughs> oh, that was actually a, a question. How many leopards do you think we've driven past today? Almost pressed the eject button. Now, I know there's been a few requests from Final Control about playing the, the recording that I have on my phone that's labeled James's soul song but I'm always a bit nervous to play something if I haven't listened to it first because you know it could go either way with me I you never know what commentary might just pop up so we'll have to listen to it at some point first I'm too scared too scared to just play something out loud like that so I think we'll check one of the favorite spots for Tingana to pop in. He, he normally he makes an appearance anywhere along this road, but he likes sort of where the Buffalo Hook signs are. He often crosses in and goes towards Gallagher. So might take a little bit of a bumble around then just have a little look-see. And then we'll do one last look for the wild dogs, but I don't know, I'm not getting my hope up today. The elephants have evaded me, barring that one. Oh. Kamora, sit down, put your feet up, because this is a long conversation. What are some of the more frustrating things that can happen in the bush? Let's use the other morning as an example, where we clearly have fresh leopard tracks. We can smell the freshly deposited urine. We can see the squirrels that are alarming and the kudu and all these things. And not just a team on foot, but a team in a car also driving around, trying to, of course, find leopards. That's infuriating, just when they just don't want to be seen. Hmm. I used to sometimes, not always though, when it was freezing cold late at night and probably raining and then the elephants would block your only way home and you'd be almost there and then you have to decide, do you sit and wait for the roadblock to go? And you know that the, man, the general manager has already got hold of you asking you where are you because you're late for dinner. Or do you do the detour that is going to take you an extra 15 or 20 minutes to go around? So things like that, they can also be a bit frustrating. I mean, not me, I don't mind normally sitting, but then when you've got time on things and you're supposed to be, you know, manage your time very well, that can be a bit hard. Mm. Other frustrating things. I don't know. Actually, there are not too many. I joked. I said when it's going to be a long thing, I, I obviously. I'm a very good guide, as you can see. So, 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 so good at exaggerating. That's something you become very, very good at as a guide. That's one thing I'll mention. So, like, it's like how a fisherman tells the story of when he catches a fish. Guiding is exactly the same. We're going to have a look at the sunset, though. We just need to get round past these trees and we'll look at the skyline, see how, how pretty it is. Should we, should we put some trees in between it, Craig, or not? Do you want trees? Do you want playing? That's prettier with all the dead trees. So I don't know how lot much longer the sun's going to be up for. Maybe another half an hour or so, 25 minutes. Maybe in 20 minutes it's going to be behind. Oh no, I suppose it will change because we'll just keep we, the direction we're going. It's actually we can. The elevation is going to work in our favor, so never mind. So if I was sitting here in about 20 minutes, the sun would drop down behind the horizon, but I'm going to carry on, so it'll probably be up for a little bit longer. We'll eventually see it set behind the Drakensberg Mountains. 
which we can't see at the moment. It's very hazy, but they are down just on the other side. And this long, straight, narrow road that you can see, this is Bivol's a cut line. So very pretty. I like the long, long, straight, dusty roads. So let's carry on. No alarm calls or anything just yet. Still waiting. I don't know the song now or the soundtrack. Do you, Craig? Well, I don't know. On the road to nowhere, that's what you said you can hear when you see the scene. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know. Do you know it, Craig? Craig says he's not sure. Maybe if we hear it, we'll know it. Okay, we're approaching Tamboti Dam now. That's in Buffalo's Hook. Come on, Tingana. I would like to see him. I'd like to see what he looks like if he's got a few scratches after his supposed battle with Gajima. That must have been impressive. I'm just glad that Tingana's feeling fit and strong again. Hukabori needs to watch out. Tingana has got bali strength, what we call it in South Africa. When you, when you get older as a man, we feel you get stronger. You've got the upper hand, you've got the experience on the young upstarts that think they know everything, but they don't. Now, I have no idea where I'm sending you to because I'm about to stop and pick up a piece of paper. Yes, she was sending you to me because I was seeing an impala ahead of us that just is just looking and I'm not sure what the impala is looking at. We just want to look at the impala and maybe he might tell us what he's looking at. He's just there, chewing card and stationary looking. It's not as windy as it was before, but then uh, my guess is the wind could have slowed this impala from eating and just wanting to be sure and being mixed feeders you always see them at the very edge of thickets and in open areas so where we are we we are on at an open area and he is just on the edge of what you call an ecotone and any small movement of a bush will definitely worry him now and you can see how he is looking but it's interesting how sometimes these animals will see what we do not see. And there's maybe a female coming in the background, coming to him, and they would be maybe much safer, or they feel much better being more in the open than being in the thicket. Tracy, very good comment. You say they look very healthy. And yes, I'll bet us going through winter now, Impalas, as I said earlier, they are mixed feeders, they always know what to eat, they look for particular leaves, they look for particular, if they have to dig particular, say, grass or particular type of plant, and any time you see impalas not in good shape, Tracy, there's always a very big concern. They have never been considered by many people as uh, good you know, health indicators, but for me, I've always thought they deserve to be like health indicators. You see one sick or not very good looking impala, it's always a concern. The way he's looking, as I say, it's funny, they will always see things we can't see, nothing myself I can see, but you can see his attention is definitely somewhere. I'm just trying to turn and to look like him, maybe not think like him, but my eyes cannot show me anything. But as Tracy said, she, you know, he looks to be a very good ram, eh? And I'm sure if the leopards would see him, be it Tingana or Hukumuri, they wouldn't mind going for him. Well, we'll swim around this area and find out what he would be looking. Not anything I can see myself. David, can you see anything yourself? No, not even David can see anything. So what we're going to do, we just go through these bushes. And sometimes what he's looking, maybe by one more turn with our eyes here, we might pick up something as we continue driving on and looking for more game. So Impala, you're looking that way and I'm now looking like you and making sure the car doesn't go to the bush.
But when you're asking, does the winter coat get thicker? What I found out the other day is the fur tends like to stand up and it gets not thicker, but it looked a little darker. And I'm not sure that's the same thing as getting thicker. It looked a little darker and I think that's because it's winter. And for that reason, they are able maybe to hold more body warmth in themselves. And I think you have a point. The fur, you know, might get a little thicker and just ideally to keep them warm. And thinking of the same, maybe the lions, could be the same, leopards could be the same, otherwise winter going to be tough to all of them. So the farm might get thicker just to make sure they, they keep warm. And thinking of big animals like elephants with all their wrinkled skins, I was wondering do the wrinkles get smaller because if you look at how wrinkled elephants are, that increases their surface area. But the good thing about big animals like elephants or rhinos or buffaloes because of their bigger body surface area, it takes them rather a long time to cool off. So if they have absorbed so much warmth during the day, the warmth will stick with them than smaller animals, for example, the squirrels or mice you know, or mongoose. The smaller you are, the easier it is for you to lose your body warmth. So I think this time around, the big animals have a big advantage over the small ones. I think the impalas would easily also lose much heat faster than the elephants or the other bigger animals like buffaloes or even rhinos. I imagine the reptiles maybe do the their, their scales on the bodies change position or do they realign them and they get much closer to each other and of course raptors will know if it's cold they either stay in the tumid mound or where they hibernate than coming out on only coming out when it's quite warm for them to get some nice you know uh, warmth from the sun i would try to imagine what raptors would do the amphibians either they would change locations and maybe come up on the surface of the water to keep much warmer. Talking of maybe frogs, for example. The toads could come out of the barrows maybe, also come a little bit out until the winter goes and then the temperatures get normal for us. And me and David now, initially I had one layer and now I have a second layer. And I would say that could be the difference between me and the impalas and maybe not before long, I might get a third layer. Eh? We have noticed as soon as the sun goes down, the temperatures tend to go down, down, down. How cold are you, Taylor, right now? Are you cold or are you warm, Taylor? Not so bad, uh, but I also have had a head start. I've had my scarf on. I've had my jersey on, just checking to see that there's nothing down at Sydney's Dam. There isn't. It's looking very quiet. Mm, I wonder if the wind hasn't scared all the animals off, although it's not going to be the perfect time for some predators to pop out because wind plus, well, I don't think it's going to have many stars tonight. Oh, found the wildebeest. Hi, wildebeest. There they are. If anyone's been wondering where they are, like I've been wondering where they are, found them. That's nice. So it's the whole herd at Sydney's Dam. So when I said to you that there was nothing at Sydney's Dam, I was lying to you. They were just hidden away behind some shrubs. And they're actually in a nice spot. It's quite sheltered where they are in that sort of depression. And they seem to be very happy. Are you coming back this way? They do look like they're coming south. So maybe by tomorrow morning, they'll be around Sandy Patch. Or maybe... Maybe they'll even just walk straight towards the open plains behind camp. That's also a possibility, but I'm so glad finally an animal. Whew. It's been a quiet afternoon. So we, should we play the game of where does everyone think the wildebeest are going to be tomorrow? Let's see. And then you have to make sure, of course, you watch the sunrise safari so that you can get the answer to this. So I think that they could be, I think they're going to be at Sandy Patch or Impala Plains, but that sort of area. Let us know where you think that they're going to be. Hashtag safari. If they could go anywhere, they could just still be here tomorrow, of course. We must remember that. That's also a possibility. But they do seem to be quite relaxed for the moment. No startled wildebeest running around. Oh, and actually, you know what? Today I'm missing the Mara. And we're going to... Well, 
We're going to listen to the sound of wildebeest now. Are you ready? Not from here, though. And then I get nervous and I'm going to say something inappropriate. So that's all the wildebeest that you're going to hear, knowing me. That is from the Mara. Of course, those are the cousins of the blue wildebeest, the subspecies, the western white-bearded gnus that were gnuing away. And you couldn't really sleep, hey, Craig, some nights. It was so loud. It was a deafening sound. I mean, we, we think that the guinea fowl and the turtle doves and sometimes the Aramark babblers make a bit of noise, but they cannot compare to the thousands and thousands of wildebeest that are all talking to one another all day long. They don't ever seem to keep quiet. They're chatterboxes. This lot, however, is very much on the relaxed side at the moment, and they don't seem to be doing too much chitter-chatter. Craig, right, sorry, I just want to see, are those guinea fowl walking on the damn wall? I think they might be, yes. Very far in the distance, in case you did see them moving through the grass. It is, of course, a flock of guinea fowl, and they do like to spend a bit of time around these areas, probably roosting in some of these big dead trees. Nice, safe spot. There is a bit of water down at Sydney's Dam, too. So this is just out of our traverse. This is in the most sort of northern corner that we can see. Very nice. Wonderful. Well, let's carry on. Let's keep doing our routes. We've got, we've got places to go, animals to see. Cindy, it's fairly easy to tell the difference between the black and the blue um, wildebeest. So basically with the blue wildebeest, you just saw their horns sort of curve around uh, like more cow's horns. Then a, blue, um, then a black wildebeest horns point forward. They're really funny. The black wildebeest are also much smaller and they've got a tuft of hair. It almost looks like they've got a piece of broom or broom bristles stuck on their face like this on their snout on the ridge of their nose. And... Uh, and that stands up, and then their tail, black wildebeest tail is also white, just to confuse you further. But they're much smaller in size. And then um, geographically, they shouldn't really occur near one another. They're, they're, they're quite sort of separate. We're just going through all the conservation areas. Hi. So we're just driving through. I always like to check here. There's also if the wild dogs are going to go to the Manuleti, they normally cross straight through here. Here's Gowrie Gate. Hello. Looks very smart now, very, very smart that all the construction is all done up. Okay, Craig, now what do we do? Do we do Voyatella Access? Because I don't really want to do the bumps on Triple M. That road over there, well, no, there. It seems weird when I point it on the camera, but that one, that's not a nice road. It's too bumpy. We just also check here for the lions, but no sign of lions. No one found those wild dogs again. We'll never know where they went unless we see them now. There's a chance that we could see them. They could have turned from the direction that they came and came this way. On north instead of further east. But we'll keep scratching around and hopefully we'll find some critters for the children. Let's go see if David has arrived at Chitwe yet. Right, it's time to look for everything now and uh, you know that we must see either on the way See on the trees, we got a nice strike there. I'm not sure that's right, gonna fly away. Let's find out. She's looking on the ground there. They tend to patch in certain areas, very open areas. Shrikes, you rarely see them patching in thickets and bushes. They're always in such open areas where they can see their food easily or what they feed on. And that's the magpie shrike. Very characteristic, black and white. Beautiful long tails they got, three, four strands there, and being blown by the wind. And what a position she got there. Eh? That was a batch of styling making that call. But what is interesting is that uh, I had a question, I think, uh, earlier from Ravinda. Their tails do not change even during the breed breeding plumage or breeding season. They tend to remain the same length of tails. But the birds, like I said earlier, like the pin-tailed waders or other waders, where the males grow such long tails, and sometimes the tails are like three, four times longer than their body sizes. 
drongos will also behave the same, patch themselves in certain areas, and then keep looking at the ground, and if they see something, they just fly and maybe get whatever, as exactly she did. And because she has done that, will also fly away. Michelle, thank you very much. You say that's very pretty. The black, the white in it, the long tail, beautiful. I agree with you, beautiful. And just seeing it fly from that patched position, fantastic. All right, it has cooled off, which is uh, not very good for me, but I got two other layers hidden somewhere, which I'll be putting on in a few minutes. And I'll be heading now to the Chitwa waterhole and find out if the hippos won't come out because this is the time for them now to be going out and looking for food at dusk once it gets a little dark, once the temperatures go down. But before we do that, we might have some two giraffes here. Uh, David, let me know where you want me to be. That's good. Sorry about that, David. And we got some giraffes browsing on some trees here. And very big advantage giraffes got, unlike all the other animals. The length. How nice to have the giraffes. And we've got a few types of giraffes, or different species of giraffe. This particular one is called the southern giraffe. Then you go for the north, we've got another species that's called the northern. And we also got another species that is called the Masai giraffe. And we're very excited today because we got school kids who are joining us. Isn't that wonderful? And look kids, we are starting the show for you with some giraffes. And the schools we have today, we've got the Windsor Intermediate Summer School, we've got the Mokland Elementary, and we've got the Longan Elementary Schools. And to all of you is a very big welcome, boys and girls. Have you seen me before? My name is David, and with me is my younger brother David, and we are all set to show you some exciting animals. But as we show you the exciting animals, we request you one small favor, ask us as many questions as you can through your teachers, because that way we shall feel excited and we shall know you are enjoying what we are showing you. If you have any comments, please also don't be shy, tell your teachers and the teachers will make sure the comments reach to us. We have opened the show for you with some beautiful giraffes there. And I'm sure you all know these giraffes or giraffes are the tallest animals. Not only here where we are in Africa, we are in the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa. Not only here, these animals are the tallest in the whole world. So I'll be asking you later on to tell me of all of you who is the tallest boy or the tallest girl in your class. And you tell me how tall you are. Some of these giraffes sometimes might go to 17 feet or, you know, in terms of length, they are so tall, five and a half meters tall. And that's a very good question. You're asking how long can a giraffe neck be? Now let's look at that one and let's do an estimate. You see that? That could be almost three meters. So we can say they can go up to nine feet. Can you imagine? Look at, she's looking at you are you there, and maybe she's giving you the exact answer. Not that way, stay, put your neck upright for Ariel. Please, giraffe, stay upright. Very good. Ariel, now we can calculate and we can estimate. Anything six, sometimes up to 10 feet, is the length of a neck of a giraffe. So she's moving away there, and I'm saying she's a she, because if you look carefully at her horns, she got something like tufts of hair growing at the end of the horns and if you see a boy the boy will have like bigger horns that are flat without any hair growing on top of the horns sometimes these horns we call them ossicos but for today let's just call them horns see how beautiful they are when they walk looking at you saying hello i 
Angela, fantastic question. What varieties of food do giraffes eat? And Angela, giraffes are animals that we call browsers. A browser animal is an animal that will eat leaves or plants that are on top. And the opposite of that is a grazer. And a grazer is an animal that will always be feeding from the ground, feeding on the grass. Now, if you see that on Angela, she is feeding on some leaves. And that's why we say it's a browser. So it's kind of food, are leaves, sometimes small twigs, but more often than not, Angela, they'll always be eating small leaves on top of the trees. And that's why we call them browsers. Diane, you're asking, are giraffes going extinct soon? That's a good question, Diane. I'll tell you, no, so far it is so good. The population or the numbers of giraffe have been very stable. We have no concern at the moment of losing the numbers or the numbers of the giraffes going down, but I would say so far, so good, and the numbers have remained stable and they're breeding. And if anybody will reduce the numbers of the giraffe are some animals that we call predators. And for example, I'm talking of about a lion. Dominic, very good question, and you're asking why do giraffes got long necks? Look at the one eating there to the right of your screen, Dominic, and if you look carefully, it's reaching the very top of the leaves. So if the neck was not that long, it would not have the advantage of eating leaves or you know plants that are that high. And because of its long neck, that's why it's able to reach the top leaves. So that's one advantage giraffes will have and the long necks helps them to reach very top leaves which many animals do not. The other animals can eat like the giraffe that can reach that high, could be the elephants, but just remember the elephants will have to use their trunks to reach the food. But the giraffes are just lucky, their long necks will help them feed. Annalise, how much, you're asking, how much do giraffes eat in a day? I'm sure, Annalise, you saw that one that was trying to scratch its head. And Annalise and the other boys and girls, if you look at the head of this one, is a bit different from the others because it got blood horns. But in a day, giraffes will eat an average of about 70 pounds of food. In one day, giraffes will eat an average of 70 or 75 pounds of food. Can you imagine eating 75 pounds of food in a day, boys and girls? Isn't that a lot? Just one giraffe in one day, about 30 kilograms, more or less. So it's about, you know, 60, 65 pounds or sometimes up to 70 pounds of food in a day. And more of them, they'll have eaten leaves or sometimes small little twigs that are soft for them. And they tend to eat better during the day because it's bright and it's not as dark. Girls, remember, out here, um, with another girl who will be telling you or showing you lots of animals, and her name is Taylor, and there'll be another boy or another gentleman who will be somewhere in a tent. But for now, let's hear what Taylor has for you and should like to say hello to all of you boys and girls. Hello. <laughs> Hello everybody. My name is Taylor, like David said, and on camera with me today is Craig, but you can call him Batman. <laughs> I'm having a good chuckle. Right. What animals do we want to see today while we're on the safari? I think you should all put your hands up one at a time and uh, tell your teachers what you would like to see today. Very exciting to have you on, on the safari, of course. Now, because it's getting a little bit darker, the sun is basically set behind the big mountains, the Drakensberg Mountains behind us. It's going to get dark now. So you're going to see... Wait, I have to find some toys down here. Got this thing now, so I'll use it to shine and look for animals and 
things that are hiding in the trees, almost there. And then we also have a big special light called an infrared light. So basically it, it shines a light that the animals aren't able to see. So we can still look at some animals that we can't use the spotlight on, although we try and keep the spotlight off of all the animals now. We just use it to find them and then once we found them, we find it's a much better way to actually see all the animals. We'll put the special light on. So soon you'll be seeing it black and white and I'll show you how dark it is um, and how cool that light is to be able to help us see things. Now we are looking for an animal called a wild dog which is an awesome creature. Let me see if I can find a picture for you quickly. I've got to find the right book though. Here we go. Ah and there's one right on the cover. Look at this creature here. Yeah, it's crazy, don't you think? That's also called an African painted dog. So that's one of the animals we're going to look out for. And there were two that were seen this morning. And uh, I really hope we can find them. They're very rare. Then the other one is you want to see cheetah. I don't know if we're going to see a cheetah. I know that they were looking for cheetah quite far east of us, but they didn't have any luck. And a cheetah and a wild dog are one of the animal, two of the animals that we don't shine a spotlight on. So we normally just look at them during the daytime. Oh, there's a little bird up ahead. Let's see who we've got here. I think it's a Senegal lapwing. But with that special light, we can still see them. Let's see. Here it goes. Not wanting to stay around though. It's not very happy with us. I don't blame it though. This is when all, all the predators, so all the leopards, the lions, the hyenas start to get active. And is it a Senegal lapping or is it a crown lapping? No, it's a Senegal lapping. Okay, cool. We're going to see lots of them tonight, I think. Anyways, the other person you haven't met yet is Ralph, and he is in a tent with lots of toys. Sorry about that, everybody. It seems as though Rolf is, he's in the tent, but he's not ready just yet. Something's gone wrong. So they'll hopefully have that all figured out in a minute. Okay, let's carry on with our search then. We haven't got anything at the moment. It's been very, very quiet today. Sorry, I need to do some, pull that cable out like that. That works. Let's see, ah, oh, we're almost getting to that time where I can really use my spotlight. So some other things we can look for that come out at night are owls. Who would like to see an owl? I'd like to see one today. A big one. I want to see the biggest owl we've got, which is of a rose eagle owl, or a giant eagle owl, as they sometimes call them. Or I would like to see a bush baby. That's a funny looking creature. It's like a gummy bear. It bounces from tree to tree, especially the, the small bush babies. And then maybe even porcupine. I'm not sure what else we're going to see, but hopefully we'll find you some animals. We're going to go to some dams as well and see if there's any creatures hanging around there. So that's also going to happen. Okay, right, let's try this for a second time. Let's go see if Ralph has actually got a voice. Sorry everybody, I'm not really sure what's going on um, with Ralph's audio, so you're just going to have to come on and drive with me. So please send your questions through so that we have got some things to talk about, because at the moment it's a bit difficult to try and find the animals. It's getting very windy, and also because the sun is going down, I don't think they're going to be very happy with that, so they're going to be a little bit nervous, so maybe they're hiding away from us this evening. see what we can find. Um, Elijah, I'm not actually sure how hot it got today. I don't know, maybe 82 degree Fahrenheit, somewhere around there. It wasn't very hot, but we are going into winter at the moment. 
so it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be too hot forever. In the mornings, it's quite cold. I have to put my scarf on. Some of the some of the other people, other guides and things, have been seeing them with beanies on as well. I still wear shorts though, and sometimes I have to put a blanket over my legs. But that's just in the morning. At night, nah, it's okay still. I mean, a little bit cold. A thin jersey, this jacket, and then of course my scarf, and that, in my opinion, is good to go. That's fine. But it's nowhere near as cold as it gets, I'm sure, where you live. If you're living where it snows, we don't get snow here at all. Okay, let's see what we can find. And here are some birds, but all the birds are going to be ready to go to sleep now. Victor, those, those, you've just asked about the wild dogs and why are the wild dogs wild? Well, because they're not domestic dogs, so they're not dogs that li can live in your home. These dogs are no, no different life. They've just lived out in the wild their, their whole life. You can see they don't look like any of the dogs that we normally see at home. They don't look like a Rottweiler, they don't look like a Labrador or a Dachshund or a sheepdog or border collie. They don't look like anything like this. So these dogs live out here in Africa. And I think in India you also get a type of wild dog there too that also roams around. So, and it's different from a feral dog, so a dog that's not being fed by any people that is just living in the bush. Um, these are these are completely different, but they're very endangered. You don't get to see them all the time. So if we get to see them, we'll be very lucky. Okie dokie. Well, I'm sure David has got some animals for you because he's at uh, an area called Chitwa where there are lots of animals. Yes, I'm lucky after we finished with the giraffes. Now, boys and girls, look what we got for you. They might be look a bit different because of the lighting. We are using something called night vision so that we can see them nicely without disturbing them and we got hippos for you you see how lucky you boys and girls are these are hippos we will also say hippopotamus and maybe sooner or later they might start saying hello can you hear that Very good, very good. Look in the final control says he can hear and I'm sure all of you can hear. And if you look carefully, all these are youngsters that have come out of the water before the adults. Hippos will always feed at night and during the day they'll spend the better part of the whole day in the water because hippos got very sensitive skins and if they would stay out of the water for a long time, their skins will dry up and they could easily die. So they have to stay in the water to cool themselves and also to hydrate or moist their skins, like how you do sunscreen when you're out on a hot day to make sure you don't get sunburn. So all the youngsters here are ready to go out and feed. And as it gets darker, like it comes to about six o'clock, they'll all start coming out of the water one after the other, and they'll be going out to eat grass. We were talking about giraffes earlier, that I told you giraffes are called browsers because they tend to eat on top of the trees, on plants that are, you know, on up. But now hippos are called grazers. Matthew, that's a very good question. What's the biggest hippo I've ever seen? The biggest hippo I've ever seen was a male, and I saw it right here where we are, and he was so big. He was almost, can you imagine, he was almost 3,000 pounds in weight. Huge, humongous male. And I think when we look at the hippos, like the group you see there, there'll be one male that will be in charge of all the females there and being in charge we say it will be the male that will be dominant and i think it was the one that was dominant and it was um, about or almost three thousand pounds in weight so you can imagine three thousand pounds how big they are so now the youngsters that once are out and they're telling the parents they're ready to go and eat 
area, that's another interesting question. You're asking why do hippos not drown? The water hole where they are, it's not very deep. And that's why even me and you, I think, can just walk through there. It's about three or four feet deep. So they will not drown because it's not very deep. So they just stand at the base and they can just comfortably walk in the water. You see like those ones that are out, if they go back in the water, if they go to the deepest area, their whole body might be covered, but what they'll do once in a while, they'll bring their mouth up so that they can be able to breathe a bit of oxygen and then back in the water. So they will not drown because it's not a very deep water hole. Friend, you're asking what's the most dangerous animal in my area and the question is so good because it's what you're watching there. Where I come from in my village, if we look at all the animals in the wilderness and we compare which have done more damage or animals that have caused more death to the human beings are the hippos. And what will happen? The hippos, they always sometimes go out, as I said, in the evening to go and get some food to go and grass because they eat grass and then early in the morning at dawn they are coming back to the water or to their home where they live and what will happen if in the village where we live we are going also either to the lake or to the water hole or to the river to fetch some water and we meet with the hippos that's when things go wrong and that's when they kill people so in the village I come from hippos have killed or have done more damage than hippos Very good, very good. We'll keep watching these hippos. Let's find out. He, Raf got something interesting to tell you. Well, everyone, let's try this all over again. My name is Ralph, and I'm in the tent because I want to show you a little bit about the skulls of all these different animals that you have been seeing. Now, I know David a little bit earlier was showing you some giraffe that were feeding through the trees. And, well, look at how big a skull of a giraffe is. It is absolutely huge. It's almost like, well, a very big baby. And it's got a very very big part on the on the forehead over here and that uh, would be one of the males that they use that when they are fighting with each other and they use that to headbutt and that's what giraffe do they look very pretty but they can have quite ugly fights and what they'll also use are these things at the top that look like horns but they're actually ossicones ossicones can you say that Aussie cones, see, that's all part of the skull, and they use that to hit each other with. Now, Sarah, one of the nicest things I find about the job is talking to all the kids and showing them all sorts of different things about the African bush because they're going to be our future rangers and they're going to be the ones also that we're going to hopefully entrust to look after our animals in the African bush and all over the world as well, whether it be in America or England or Australia or China or Hong Kong. Kong, wherever you might be in the world, we need to look after our animals. And like this giraffe who died of old age because he was protected in a national park, well, we want to be protecting all of the animals around the world as well, don't we? So I want you to think about what the next skull I should be showing you because when we come back, I'm going to show you some carnivore skulls. So I'm going to look for them and I'm going to head you off in the meantime to Dave. Yes, and I'm sure at one point, Raf will show you a skull of this animal here. Look at this big hippo. He's out of the water and a baby so close and a bird walking there. Look at the size of that baby there. Coming so close to mama, I would guess. Aren't you lucky, boys and girls? We saw the youngsters from a distance in a small little island. We just moved a bit with David, another like 20 meters, and we found this huge hippo out of the water completely. Nikki, that's a nice question. Do hippos sleep in the water? Once they spend the day out feeding, 
they always come back in the water and when they're in the water they'll have small naps i'm sure you have seen cats having naps for three minutes then waking up five minutes then waking up also hippos can close their eyes and they got a very special membrane in their ears not to allow the water to go in their ears and they can go underwater and have a nap for like three or four minutes and then they're up nick so yes hippos can sleep in the water comfortably See, boys and girls, we have a nice big bird there that's called an egret. It's called a great egret. And these types of birds are always found near water areas. So we have hippos here because hippos will always, or hippos can't do without water. And this egret will always feed, uh, they'll always get their food in water, be it fish and their flies, amphibians. Yeah, good question. Uh, what do we call baby hippos? A baby hippo, we'd call a baby hippo a calf. You see like how you call a calf for like an elephant? That's a very good question, Kia. What do you call baby hippo? A baby hippo is called a calf. Thank you very much, that's a nice question. And a group of hippos, you can call a school. Jamal, you're asking, why do hippos stay in groups? Hippos are very social and here in the bush you need to stay in big numbers because if for example we got about 20 hippos here that translates or that means they got 40 eyes and if they got 40 eyes that way they are able to see any enemies or any predators that will be coming to them and their main predator would be lions. Can you hear them in the background? So by staying in a group, by staying together, very good. All those... Nice. Are hippos communicating? And I'm sure they're deciding when to leave the water and where to go. So when they stay together like this, it's easier for them to see the animals or enemies. Sorry, I missed that question, Luke. And you're asking how big are hippos jaws? They are huge. If you like to see one opening the mouth, sometimes they open up to about 180 degrees and they got very huge teeth. The incisors and canines are so big and they need also flat big teeth to be able to chew the food. And you can see now that young one moving close to the mother and Hippos got so many teeth, unlike we human beings, when we are fully grown as adults, we got about 32 teeth. Hippos got about 36 teeth, and all of them are huge teeth. Let's find out. Taylor might, will want to tell you something interesting. We haven't been having much luck all day long, I'm afraid in finding animals they've all been hiding away from us i think it might be craig i think they might be scared of him but i see something on the floor what's down on the ground i'm also just joking it's not craig oh no sit down again it's a night jar it's one of the nocturnal night birds that we see let me see if i can get a view it hasn't landed yet turn my lights off let me see if we can yeah, it's still there Where is it going to land though? It's just flown off the road. Let's see if we can get a view. They're really pretty. They're very camouflaged. So if it has landed down in the grass, I don't know if we're going to see it. Let me check carefully. No, it's hiding away. Uh, yes, Jacob, you've asked about if the animals um, still come out in winter. None of our animals hibernate so it doesn't get cold enough for to do that. So sometimes what they will do though, is they still sort of do similar things that animals would do if they hibernate, like the squirrels start collecting uh, lots of nuts and, and things like that, that they can stash and hide away. And then things like tortoises, well actually, and lots of the insects, some of the big things like scorpions and even the snakes and 
solifuges and all these crazy looking like insects they also hide away but they don't hide away forever they might hide away for a week if it's very very cold and then the next week if the sun comes out they can also come out so we call that estivation so they don't hibernate they estivate and well, that's the difference between the animals here and I suppose further up north come on where are the animals Eloise, yes, animals do get cold like humans. They, I suppose they do, but they've got all the, that hair on them. They've got those nice coats to keep them warm. And remember, they're also used to it. So um, over time, they're able to adjust. And, you know, they know it might be cold one night, but as soon as the sun comes out, they'll be nice and warm again. Maybe some of them huddle together to stay nice and warm. What's that? Craig, I think it might be a little day cave here. Can you see it? We're going straight in there. I'm going to keep the engine going. Okay, just keep it. I think you might have to stay zoomed in because it's right in, in there. Yeah, in that gap. Can you, you see in that hollow of trees there? If you go all the way in, it's there. It's just to the left of the screen, stay like that. There we go. Look, look, look. Oh, it's so hard to see it. Well, that'll have to do. That creature over there is an antelope, and it's one of the smallest antelope that we have in the area. It is called a daker. And I think it might be a little boy, because I think I see some sharp, tiny little horns, but they're really small, and you often find them in areas like this. See, it's surrounded by trees, so it's a good place to hide away. But it's very difficult to see. They normally don't hang around for too long, but I think it's because I don't have a light on them. See, this is another animal we won't shine the light on. So we've got the infrared light on now. And it seems to be relaxed. Very cool to see. Whoops. Let's see what else we can find. Cameron, you've asked about what the coolest animal I've ever seen is. Oh, I've seen lots of cool animals. The snakes are very cool. We've got some awesome snakes. Even seeing a crocodile is amazing, or a lion and a leopard. And then there's a creature that comes out at night. Let's see if it's made the front cover of the book. Called an aardvark, or an earth pig. Let me find a picture for you. Because that is a crazy, crazy thing to see. Yeah, I think we're in the right section. Yeah, look at that. That's what I want to find you tonight, but I have not seen one of those for a very, very long time. And they're really big too. They're obviously small in the book, but they're massive in size. So let's hope we can find them. They like to eat termites, and they like to eat ants, and there's actually a hole from where one was digging just the other day. So I think, <laughs> excuse me, this is a good road to check to see if we're going to find an aardvark. Okay, anyways, Rolf is still in the tent and I think he's looking at some skulls. Ahaha, this is a very big skull with very big teeth. I wonder if you know which animal that one might be, if you can see it nicely. He's got huge teeth, but he's also got very big eyes on the front. Look at that. So that's not a normal, uh, like a carnivore's skull, because look how the eyes are on the front of the face, all right? And look at my eyes as well. Look where they are. They're also on the front of my face, not on the side of my face, like a lot of the antelope. Um, these are very much in the front. So which animal do you think that is? Because if we look at, uh, this one is a leopard, and if you can see where his eyes are, they're not fully on the front of the face. They're not also right on the side. They're a little bit in between, okay? And that has got very big teeth as well because those teeth need to be able to kill an animal. And it's normally perfect size on a leopard to be able to get onto a throat of like an impala or a warthog. But that is a leopard. And this one, I want to know which one you think that is. Who does that look like? 
Now, Hunter, you want to know which is the smallest skull we have, so I'll give you a chance to think about that first skull and who you think that is. Um, I'm going to look at, it's possibly one of these little guys here, and that is like a little monkey. And you see, he's also got the, the eyes on the front of his head, and that's very uh, much like us. And because we are primates, and we are very similar to monkeys, well, some of us more than others, I think I'm very close to a monkey, but uh, maybe some of you not as close to a monkey as I am, but, well, my head is a little bit bigger, and my eyes are on the front of my face but Brody I know that you want you're asking if we have a hyena skull I don't have a hyena skull but because you haven't answered my question I'm going to tell you that this is a baboon and baboons have huge teeth look at that almost as big as that of a leopard and even of a lion now, I also know that Taylor was talking about wild dogs earlier, and this skull, oh, Jacob, you said baboon for that one. Well done, Jacob. You were absolutely right. And this skull here, like I said, oops, one of the teeth fell out. These are quite old skulls, so the teeth do generally fall out. Uh, even like us as humans, I think I might start losing some teeth soon, uh, but I'm getting a bit older. Anyway, this is a wild dog, and it's very similar. If you had to look at your dog at home and just lift up his lip a little bit, but careful, don't hurt him, you'll see that the teeth of a wild dog is very similar to the domestic dog. Not exactly the same, but almost the same. And they also have quite sharp teeth over there, but very important, they have these sharp teeth on the side, which uh, helps them to be able to cut the meat. Now, I'm going to look for some other little skulls, and while I'm doing that, I'll send you on over to David next to the waterhole. Skulls are always interesting boys and girls to watch because we'll always see them out on the drive and look at the beautiful sky and the trees and see how the darkness is coming across here. It's heading to about 6 o'clock here and it's already getting very dark. And David is doing the best he can to show you the great views of Africa and see whether he can bring you across a little bit closer to the hippos that we saw before. Yuzek, that's a very good question. Where do the animals know where they are going? Most of them are very clever, or all animals are clever. And like hippos, for example, there are particular trails or paths that they will always use to get to their feeding grounds. So they'll tend to use the same trails. And they will know we are going this way, and we left our water hole this way. When we finish eating, this is the same way we're going to come back. So most of the animals will know where to go and where to come back. But now I'm talking about hippos that have a particular place to come back. So they could go feed anywhere, but they'll have to know they have to come to a particular area because that's where they live. But you've got other animals, for example, elephants or buffaloes or giraffes. Boys and girls, they made me keep quiet because... Can you just hear that? Don't worry, the pictures are not very good because it's a bit dark, but why don't you enjoy those great sounds from the hippos? And that's how they communicate. But boys and girls, I'll tell you something interesting. We do not know what they shall tell each other. Sometimes we think they're making jokes to each other. Sometimes we think they're singing. Or sometimes they're saying, another five minutes we shall be out and go and eat, have our early dinner. We have been in this water the whole day. So as much as it's getting dark, you can just hear them splashing the water. And as it's getting dark, because we can't see them very well now, we'll be telling the hippos goodbye and have a nice evening. And Taylor wants to talk to you again. Boys and girls, all right. Well, because all the animals have been hiding away from us, I've resorted to driving my favorite road. One of my favorite roads. Oh, look, there's another daycare, Cray. 
See, look, it's another one. Who we got here? Also a little boy. Hello. This actually looks like a young one. This doesn't look like an adult. Looks a bit smaller than the one we just saw. Kip, now you've asked if antelope are nocturnal. Well, they're sort of a bit of both, I suppose. We, we can see them at night very uh, during the day very well. But what determines if an animal is nocturnal or not, I suppose, has got something to do with its eyesight. Now, obviously, you and I can't see very well at night. It's hard, hey, when you go outside and sometimes you stand and you look and you just can't see anything. So some animals can see better at night than others. Now, something small that's quite secretive, that common daker that we just saw, that small antelope, they do move around quite a bit at night, but they don't all just stop eating. They all sort of carry on with their days, but their eyesight is nowhere near as good as a lion or a leopard. They can, they've got special rods and cones in their eyes that allow them to see with almost no light so lions have got this really cool adaptation where they've got white underneath their eyes and that helps any starlight any moonlight to reflect back into their eyes to help them see a little bit better how clever is that so you don't see too many antelope that have that on them so they see much better during the day but then they've got very good hearing so they'll use that sense at night now isaac you've asked why do the eyes glow at night so that happens when light is reflected off of the eyes it's very complicated one day when you're a little bit bigger we can go into a lot more detail about it but um it's basically called the tapetum flash but you don't have to worry about that word that's just the reflection of the light so even though we can't see the infrared light remember that special light that we have on that makes everything look like it's in black and white and um, that's still it's still a wavelength it's just we can't see it so it's still going to reflect off of the eyes of the animal and if we do that and that's what i'm looking for with the spotlight is i'm just looking for eye shine i'm looking for that now there's an old wives tale of some people say that depending on the type of animal their eye color flashes back a different color but that's not true that just depends at what angle you hold the light now in front of us i'm going to switch all the lights off lights off because they're panicking now here we've got two scrub hairs hello scrub hairs now they might be a little bit disorientated from my headlights. So when disorientated means it, it might be a bit fuzzy. You know when someone thinks it's funny to, fly, uh, to shine a flashlight in your eyes and you can't see very well for a little bit? That's basically what happened to these scrub hairs. But as soon as I saw them, I t turned those lights off very, very quickly. And now they'll be able to relax a little bit, you see, because they also can't see very well at night. So they're using their hearing. You can see how those ears keep twitching like big big antennas moving round and round trying to pick up any sounds and then they'll also be using their nose they'll be using their sense of smell too now yes if you're wondering what my favorite wild animal is it's an elephant that's my favorite one i'm sad i didn't get to show you an elephant today but these scrub hairs need to be very very careful out here because there's so many things that want to eat them like a leopard or a lion would want to eat them although that's not much food for them and then also they need to not just look out for predators on the ground big owls will swoop in silently and try and catch them too so they've got to be very, very careful. And they, they do provide lots of meals for lots of different animals out here. But they're nibbling on some grass now. Very exciting stuff, right? We're going to carry on because I'm hoping to find you maybe a chameleon or one of the other weird creatures that move around here. Rolf is still in the tent. Well, I just wanted to show you a few different things that I've collected to show you here because um, it's very interesting, I must say. Now, we know who this is with these very big tusks like this, but when we see him out in the bush, he looks quite small, doesn't he? But when we see him next to us, he's actually quite large. Now, this is a skull of Pumba or the warthog, but look how big he is. And as I say, he looks quite small when he's out there, don't you think? But these are modified teeth that we've got over here. Now, Cameron, I don't unfortunately have any dinosaur uh, skulls to show you, but I do have some other interesting ones here. So that's a warthog. Now, this one here that looks like he's got dreadlocks on his horns, that is an impala's skull. Wow. Oh, I 
was just listening because I thought I might have heard a leopard, but maybe not. I'll have to listen out. Now, leopards do eat impala, and, uh, well, this is also a very big skull, don't you think? And these little things coming out of the horn are little worms. Now, Micah, um, I actually can't remember how many animals I've seen in my life. I'm still counting, but I'm pretty sure it's over a thousand at least. From all the birds and the frogs and the mammals and the antelope and the lions and leopards and elephants and tortoises and snails and... Wow, it's just so many I can't remember. But let's go on to some of the other things that I've got here. Now, look at these. These two shells are from the same species of animal, but just uh, at different ages. Now, these are called African giant land snails, and they are the largest snails in the world. That's pretty impressive, don't you think? And they do live in Africa. But what they do is, at this time of the year, in winter, they'll be under the ground. And they're waiting for summer to come when it rains. And then they'll come out of, from underneath the ground. And then they'll walk around on top of the, the, the roads. And one animal that eats some of these snails is a leopard tortoise. And why does he eat him? Because he needs lots of calcium for this very big, hard shell that he makes for his home. So that is a leopard tortoise, but obviously he's not in there anymore. He maybe was uh, eaten by something like a hornbill or something like that. So he's got his own house on his, sh on his back, and it's very heavy and lots of calcium that he needs to carry around. So... Um, like this guy who's in his little home, well, not for now anymore, you are heading off home and we're going to say goodbye. I hope you join us once again on a school drive because it's been lovely happy having you. And I want to say goodbye for now and see you all soon. Bye, guys.